Hi everyone, we're just waiting a couple minutes to get the Facebook Live up and to get the uh, let in a few more participants if they're out there. So just another minute. Facebook, so I will uh, first welcome everyone back to day two of our Handball Development Symposium. Really want to thank everyone who's tuning in for the second day and really appreciate your dedication and commitment um, on a weekend. We know that's difficult, so thank you for being here. Um, we've got another great round of presenters and lessons planned for today, so I'm going to turn it over to Craig and Julio once again. Uh, their first lecture today is going to be understanding the game as a coach. So without further ado, Craig and Julio. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I just want to say thanks for coming out. It, I know it's a busy weekend and yesterday was a full day, but this is a really important day too as we build on yesterday's lessons to uh, uh, begin looking at the game from the coach's perspective. Um, Julio, would you like to say anything? Good morning, everybody. Um, <clears throat> welcome again. Uh, yes, a little bit early here in in the in the in the Pacific Coast, but we're ready. So let's do it. Morning. <laughs> morning. Okay, I, I didn't know I was muted. Okay. <laughs> That's our. That, there's August from XPS, who's our uh, second presenter today. Uh, when we're finished with understanding the game as a coach. Um, I'm going to start us out by just reminding us where we were yesterday and where we finished up. Uh, we made it through the uh, uh, most of the pyramid building uh, for development, which means we, we started out at rudiment and technical and went to joint technical, moved over to tactical drills. Uh, and today we finish with uh, uh, small group collaborations, uh, tactical games, and uh, basic game forms. So, uh, but I just want to start where we left off or where we, st I want to start by looking at something we looked at yesterday when we started, despite I had the fact I had a couple of technical difficulties. I want us to look now at the same situation from the uh, view of the coach. Okay, and so yesterday we remember it's the last second of the last 30 seconds of a game. Right now we have uh, uh, Martinique against USA tie game for us to continue in the tournament we must win they must tie uh, or for them to uh, move on and so it was a really important moment for us um, something I'm going to set up contextually though that as a coach I was a little in a little bit of dire straits here um, our at we had actually been leading this game by six goals with 10 minutes left when our star uh, right back and right wing or this player who played both positions got injured and was out. And from that moment on, we went on a perilous ride of, and Julio was there up in the stands cheering us on, <laughs> but it was, um, it was a rough nine and a half minutes getting to this point where we were tied because my team had lost a lot of its game sense for the gameplay. And, uh, and with the injury gone, it, it disconnected our uh, attack and placed a lot of emphasis on our player who, who scores this goal, but uh, in a way that made it difficult for him for about 10 minutes. And so as a coach, 
uh, uh, it was important for me to come up with the right tactic for this moment. And so I had no right wing at this point. And so I brought in that number 14 right there as the second pivot, as a tactical pivot. The kid had never played the, really the position before. And the number 16, my star pivot, I, who already had nine goals in the game, I had pushed to the side. Uh, and, and had him out in the Scandinavian position, uh, hopeful that I knew that Amar coming across with his favorite shot, which I mentioned yesterday in another lecture was the, is the faint to wing, but, or to right back, but we didn't have that set up, but it's his favorite shot. And I was trying to put all the action on one side so it would free him to have the other, but I didn't know if it was going to work. And as, as we're going to watch right now, you can see that it did. 30 seconds left and we're and this is the this is the hardest part about it right here we have almost all six players are on one half of the court because i have my right wing out there uh who's not injured who doesn't really know the game that well trying to we were lucky here in the fact that we got a two minutes which made the tactic that we were working on all the all the more better now we have the space what do you think you I'm, we'll right I'm going to watch it through once and then slow mo at a couple points. As we look at the replay in slow mo, I'm going to freeze it twice to look at something here. That was crazy. Right now, if you look, all five of their players are within eight feet of each other, which means I have one open player here, one open who has little experience. I have one open player here who has a lot of experience and was 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 killing it in this game, except in late game situations. He's not always the best. And out of frame is a wing who's open. So right now we have the, the traditional 1v3. I'm going to fast forward to it. Is going crazy. What a win by the U.S. to win 34 to 33. Let's look at it again. Watch as this unfolds. That was crazy. So there. So right now he could pass back to the pivot, and and that's for him normally that's a 90 percent shot, but it's under a lot of stress, and the wing is open, and we have a cutting move with our center back there. At the second point, the tactical pivots out of place was supposed to be holding the big guy back but tried to go under him, but it didn't matter as you know, but I now have a pivot and a wing with, with half the court to their own and five defenders fixated on my, my player. As he shoots, even then there's, mind you, there's like five or six seconds left. You have a competent uh, right back there who can make that shot if he does, but it didn't matter. He made it. I knew that was his highest percentage shot. Like as a coach, like each of your players has has a skill set, and I knew in that situation he was the one that we had to have make that shot. And that's a it's it goes against. I mean, it's a one v five situation. You don't always script it, but it's important as we go forward to understand that as a coach you need to know the the players so well. And we're going to talk about this as we go forward. And now we come back to what what coaching is. Coaching is a job in which you must see the forest and the trees. You must see the parts and the whole simultaneously and look at it in such a way that you can understand it. And so we've been building this pyramid. I mean, I, I'm, I love talking about this, but we've been building this pyramid. We got rudimentary skills at the base and game understanding at the one base and physical conditioning as the main base. You know, but as we build up the pyramid, we now change our view. We look at gameplay. Improving gameplay is a coach's only job. I'm going to repeat that. Improving <clears throat> gameplay is a coach's only job. It literally encompasses every task you do as a coach, except maybe when in the United States when we have to get airline tickets to go to tournaments. You know, so almost every function is fixated on gameplay. You can say, "Oh, but what about your the individual player's technical development?" As long as you streamline it in your head that it's it, the most important thing for them and for you is gameplay. It makes your job easy and it makes you, or not easy, but it makes your, your, the understanding of your job easier than just all of these different parts. And I think that was the biggest step for me when I learned to coach really at handball coaching is that because of the speed of the game and the intensity of the game and the dynamics of the game, you really have to consider a lot at, at one time. And I'm going to talk about that right now.
we're going to first look at uh, the four elements of the game or consider this in, in every game in every moment, there's four competing and interrelated elements. There's structure, which means like formation, positioning, and space. We talked a lot about space yesterday, like fixated on space, not just space that you want to attain, but space you're using to get to it. Okay. There's the relationship between sequencing, timing, and variability. We talked a lot about the, uh, the, the sequencing and variability yesterday and how it was important to build that into your, uh, practice tasks. And now I want you to understand that's important to understand when you're writing and developing game tactics. Okay, then there's ball circulation. We talked so showed movement with the ball and without the ball. There's ball circulation and there's player movement. Sometimes they're together, sometimes they're apart, but those are all deliberate parts of handball. And one of the unifying parts of handball is because it's an invasion game against a, a, a uh, structured zone. Uh, unlike basketball, where you can continue through and do through plays and continue again, handball is 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 a battle fought at that at that at the goal area wall. It's fought there, where the defense and the offense meet. There, that's that's where the game is played, and it's played between. And understanding as a coach, you have to understand we have to look closer at transition offense, offense, transition defense, and defense. If my slide hadn't failed yesterday, you would have seen this graphic and had it broken down for you. Unfortunately, yesterday had our technical errors, but today we're doing better. Okay, I want us to first look at counterattack, and this is important: the objects of the game for counterattack. Because I'm first going to tell you them, and then I'm going to tell you why they're important. Moving quickly to advance uh, players and ball up the court, using width and depth to create multiple passing lanes, recognizing the best available option for execution or change to organized attack. These objects of the game. Now that we're on the context side, today we're really focused on the context side. Uh, uh, Small-sided games, uh, tactical games, and partial and basic and standard game forms. Now we're talking about the game it's, games itself, and the objects of the games need to be embedded into our practice philosophies. You know, our, what is the object of this drill I'm doing? It's to move the ball quickly up and, uh, and move players with it. You know, and so like th these objects that I'm telling you aren't just ideas about them. They're governing principles of the micro phase of attack, or in this case, counterattack or of defense or of retreat. So here we have three moving quickly up the up the court with the ball, uh, using width and depth to create passing lanes, recognizing the best available option for execution or change to organize attack. Then we're in attack. The three, uh, the three objects of the game are creating favorable space for player movement and cir ball circulation. That's, that's embedded into all of the games we're going to talk about today. Uh, penetrating spaces of greatest value, scoring a goal and transitioning to retreat. Because remember, we talked about this yesterday. There's always one player with the ball, but there's five players without the ball. And so while your one player's object of the attack might be the finalization the object of the game in that final phase or micro phase for the players without the ball is to transition to retreat. They need to be on with the fast throw offs and stuff like that. They need to be on the, on their game plan right away. Objects of the game for retreat, applying immediate pressure to slow or halt the player movement and ball circulation corresponds with the other, the first level for uh, counterattack. forming a temporary structure to defend passing lanes. Again, it corresponds to it because in when we develop the, the games when we talk about practice tasks today it's always oppositional because they're games there's not just it's not isolated you know some people ask when do we do this well this is what we're talking about now we we're always doing game like conditions and so this oppositional relationship matters forcing counterattack into spaces of least value to thwart attacking intention create a turnover or force a low percentage shot again scoring a goal or uh, on the retreat was finding the spaces of greatest value and here you're trying to force them into the least value. My favorite thing is to force a really fast player to a bad angle where they're sliding past the diminishing angle and they shoot and my goalie just stands there and takes it. It was a wasted attack for them, but it was a win for me. And then on defense, harassing small group collaboration, applying consistent pressure while disrupting attacking attention, regaining ball possession or forcing a low percentage shot. Again, most people don't consider this, but forcing a bad shot is a win in defensive terms. Forcing a missed shot is, you know, a low percentage shot that misses is, is, is a defensive skill, forcing that, learning it, okay? As a coach, we must always be mindful of cohesiveness. 
This is important. And we're going to talk about this right now for just a second. As a coach, you must be mindful of cohesiveness. There's collective unit cohesion. There's the overall team. How, what, how, are, how are we linked together? And then there's the specific basic phases, attack and defense. How is my attack? How is my defense? Sometimes players are part of both. Sometimes they're only part of one, but each has its own cohesiveness. Sometimes I have teams that are really strong cohesively in attack and they get back on defense and I'm holding my breath, hoping to survive as a coach. Sometimes it's the opposite. Sometimes I can make the greatest defense and put it together. And, and then on the other end, I just can't, the, my players can't solve the problems confronting them. And a lot of it has to do with where they're at in their development. Defense usually comes first. You usually become more proficient at defense than you do at offense because there's less technical skills to learn in defense. And then there's cohesion between players with shared roles. These roles can be like backcourt or they can be as specific as left back. There's like a cohesion that we need to have. If I have a left back uh, and a right back and a center back that they need, the backcourt players need to have cohesiveness. The line players need to have cohesiveness, the interior defenders. And, and the idea here is that shared roles are different than what we're going to talk about next. But shared roles are important. Shared roles mean as a coach, I'm look, I, I basically it's called commander's intent. Commander's intent is basically the over, governing principles of everything below it. And I assign roles. Another coach may assign another one. I work with Christian and I've worked with Julio and I, everybody assigns a different weight to the roles the players play on the court. It was great to hear Robert yesterday. I'll be honest with you. It was awesome for me to hear Robert talk about what he wants. That's his commander's intent. He wants two-way wing players that are strong outside defenders, strong in collaboration, and he wants them to get taller so he can then have them maybe even play the, the half defender. It was great to hear him. That's his commander's intent. Every player is different. I mean, every coach is different and they look at the role of the, of these type of like standard groups, you know, like for me, I, I have a center back taste that is so obvious. Everybody knows it. I can call, I can tell you the lineage right now from, from Tegan, who I showed you with the sidearm to John Mall on the deaf national team against again in the hearing realm impossible to stop because it doesn't matter he's so fast and his technical skills are so good and his drive is unbelievable and greg and ahara i have a type i'm over on the women's side trying to now find that type for the youth and juniors because i know like and robert said it yesterday he wants a playmaker at center back he wants a menace it's some some people like it tactically as service like when we play argentina I love the Argentina youth and junior, uh, the, the young man that came up one in the same time our, my players did, because he was always the final solution. He set everything up, but you always knew in the back of your head that they were coming to him no matter what. No matter what, he was the final solution, but he seemed so passive, and then he would collapse at the, at, at the final attack, and you, he would be impossible to defend. And it, for me, it was like, I took him out in a game and afterwards the, the, someone had said, why did you take out their center back? And I said, cause I took out their final solution and it really did help us. We've cut it like an eight goal margin down to six, but understanding roles and commander's intent is important, but I'm going to focus now on what I feel is the most important factor in the game. <clears throat> the most important factor is the cohesion between the players with shared responsibilities. These are the small groups, the left back, the left wing and the pivot working together, the right wing, the right back and the pivot working together, center back, left back and pivot, outside and half defenders, half and inside defenders, inside defenders. The, the, the collaboration that they have, they must have cohesion because in the end, if they have a, if that gr those groups are broken, we cannot win the moment. It doesn't matter if my, in those, the top line, the left back, the right back, and the center back have cohesion if they can't collaborate with the others in the, uh, with the line players. It just doesn't matter. And so for me, it's a very important thing. And I look at, and I'm going to show you in a graphic, I look at this cohesion as the most important role of my job as a bench coach. And I'll explain why. And that seems strange, but I think it even is superior to tactics. And I'm going to present a question to you and we're going to debate it in a minute. But cohesion is greatly affected by two factors, chemistry and fatigue. Again, chemistry and fatigue. Chemistry is different than 
Chemistry is different than cohesion. Cohesion is as a group, they're in the, like we talked about it yesterday, they're in synergy, the techno-tactical synergy, and they perform their function well. Chemistry is different. Chemistry is when two players together are better in gameplay than they would be alone. And the opposite of that is, is true also, because there's players who are individual, who have bad chemistry with players, they still get results but they totally go out there and they break down the game into stubborn parts of individual play and, uh, and either turnover or miss shot or goal. You know, it's like, it's one or the, it's one or the other of those. And so chemistry and fatigue are the two greatest factors. And I was glad that Jared from the USOPC discussed the two types of players. Cause we'll come back to that at fatigue, but I first want to talk about attack chemistry. Now I've set up for you exactly what I would, how I would describe the team you saw in the first video. You have, I wish I had Jared's little thing, the cap, <laughs> the laser pointer. You have Amar at left back, the shooter. You have a very good left wing, um, but he has no chemistry with the team because he, does, he, he doesn't play with them often. You have very strong chemistry between the center back and the pivot because they practiced four days a week together. And they both were at a very strong developmental point. They both were strong factors in that game. When we were up six goals, when we were up six goals, even though I had an identical to the left back at the right back position. And when he got injured, I had to pull a player from the right wing to right back. And I had to put in a second pivot here, but I want you to visualize what I see as a coach, because what you see in the shading matters because it affects every decision you make during the game. And it might even be more important than the tactics because you have to micromanage the, you can micromanage the chemistry. It's really hard to micromanage the decision-making. You're really just setting and forgetting and putting it out there. And I learned this from the deaf national team, coaching the deaf national team, because communication, I had to stop communicating with them in ways that I was used to. And it was all about, were they prepared enough and set them out, call timeout 10, 12 minutes in to then check to see, you know, what we need to adjust. But this is important to represent in your head as a coach. When you see the game, this cohesiveness, this chemistry matters. And that decision I made tactically at the end to put the pivot over in the Scandinavian position to bring the right wing into this position, knowing they would fixate on him, but knowing he had the skills, it was actually supposed to be a cross, but you can see the center back is marked. You can see it. My original plan was a cross, but the, and a cut through to, for him to get the favorable shot he wanted. The pivot would hold back the, would I was hoping hold back the big guy, or the, the smaller guy and this guy, uh, the, my tactical pivot would hold back the main guy, defender, except what ended up happening was different. All five defenders knew my game plan, but it didn't matter. He was still good enough to beat all five. But as a, it, as a coach, I have to give him complete credit. He had the perfect shot at the correct time and worked it the way he had to. Okay. Even though the left wing was wide open and even though the pivot was wide open. And the same goes with defense chemistry. The relationship between the parts matters. The people matter, okay? And this is where we have to understand the game as a coach. Chemistry matters, how they relate. As if I'm attacking this defense, I wanna finalize over here. This is a perfect place for me to finalize. I've got a, I've got a player in the manipulation phase and I've got a player in the uh, uh, practice phase. And so it's like, I, I know where I need to go with that. And then it comes down to fatigue, each player. And this is what was great about Jared yesterday. He talked about it. Each player is different. Type one is above. He talked about type one and type two. Type one is above, top line, type one, type two below. Each player degrades in quality. That's the same player after time. And it's important to see it this way because you have to manage that as a coach. The quality of the gameplay matters. And look at the player too. If I were to leave him out on the court or her out on the court for 30 minutes, look where she's at compared to the player one. The type one endurance and type two endurance matters. And you need to understand your players and their qualities. Because once you lose your legs, you lose your head. Gameplay degrades. It doesn't matter what I know. I'm no longer successful. And that's important. The five realities of coaching team handball. The game moves too fast to micromanage moment. Players need to focus on the gameplay and not their coach. This is huge. 
Let the plan prove itself right or wrong and then adjust if needed. The first five minutes and the last 10 minutes of each half are the most important in a game. Know what you are going to do in a situation before you face it. This is key. This is key. Okay, and before I turn it over to Julio, I'm gonna have one more slide for us to consider because this answers a lot of questions. <clears throat> Real question you must ask yourself as a coach. If you can't have both right, would you rather have the right players and the wrong tactic or the right tactic and the wrong players? I know what I want. I always want the right players out there because they will, they will figure it out and make it work. It doesn't matter how well the game plan is and the strategy is if I have the wrong players that are fatigued or don't have chemistry. And so understanding the game as a coach is like this micromanaging of all these factors as you go along. And now I'm going to hand it over to Julio because what he has to say is really the structural part of being a coach. And it's an important message. So uh, good morning, everybody. Um, once again, thank you, uh, Craig, for a fantastic uh, preamble to uh, what I'm what I'm going to be talking about. So, <clears throat> Craig, in a nutshell, have actually provided us the fun, the foundation to what I'm going to be talking right now, which is now a deep dive more into the uh, the position of the coach, uh, specifically uh, during the game and in before the game and sometimes after the game, and how important the correlation from everything that he have said especially in the last slide, talk, talks a little bit about, you know, uh, where is it that you want to go? What is your ideology? What is the philosophical idea that you have as a coach and when do you want to go? You know, what are the things that you're willing to negotiate and what are the things that you're not um, willing to, to negotiate in the process of coaching? You know, um, he talks about cohesion and about chemistry and, and, and fatigue at, at, at a certain point. Uh, you need to start um, um, transporting that information into the actual um, situation that is going on in the game. So for me, um, it is important that if I want to in, improve the gameplay, because remember, we like if we go back to the pyramid, we're now at the top of the pyramid where everything, and I agree with what Craig says, everything that uh, influences the actual game playing uh, it is the responsibility of, of the coach and, and how prepared and how well planned and how much understanding you have of um, the instrument that you have, uh, 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 you know, uh, that you have created. Okay, for me, it's important is the analysis, you know, self-analysis is important, which is basically what, what um, um, Kerr was talking, also the opponent analysis and the post-game analysis. Why is important the post-game analysis? It goes back to what we were talking yesterday. And in a nutshell, I'll rephrase it like this. You have to empower your strengths and you have to manage your weaknesses. If we use what Craig was saying um, as a parallel, you know, you have to understand where, where you are in the game uh, in terms of, of the, the development of those players and how that actually interfaces with the cohesion that you want to create in your in your um, in your uh, team and then empower that and see the other parts who are not working properly and manage their weaknesses. It is important to understand that, that it's not about trying to get them to where the other ones are because what's gonna happen is that the labor is gonna, is gonna uh, uh, get lower. What you need to do is manage their weaknesses so they can actually be at, a, uh, at intermediate or a balanced um, you know, level. The game plan, what was your game plan in terms of what are you planning to do with your individual players? What, what is the role that they're gonna be playing? You know, what is it that you expect from your small group? And what is, what is it that you expect from your faces? I think that's a, a very important um, decision that you have to make. Uh, Craig was talking about um, the structure that I have created in my teams. And part of it is because I don't have the lecture the, the, the luxury of, of having them together for 30 days or 21 days. I think for Spain, we were uh, seven days together and, and it was actually a progression of what we started doing in 2018. So you have to create a, a script. We call it a script and what is it that you want in each one of the phases and how they're gonna do it with a little, with, with a little to no window to uh, 
further improvisation. So everything has to be in, in a sense organized uh, in a way that it can be actually transported to every single um, you know, uh, situations. And then the adjustments, they have to be on the fly. Uh, and why on the fly? Because of the, how vertical this game is. You know, we were talking yesterday about, you know, the, the, the psychological flexibility that is required on, on, this, on this game. And uh, thinking on the fly, uh, the core sense, developing that is important, not only as a player, but also um, as a coach. Sub substitutions are very important, okay? Uh, is it the right time? Is it the right player? Am I actually you know, affecting the synergy of uh, the, uh, the game, the, the, uh, the actual outcome of the game because I'm making a substitution that is too soon or too late? Is it a problem of, and we'll talk about this in a, in, in a few uh, next slides. Is it a problem of the tactics or is it a problem uh, related to the, to the players? Or is it a problem related to the synergy that we were talking before, the cohesion that you require to actually um, have the machine work properly? Timeouts. When do you take, when do you take the timeouts? What is the information that you provide to them during halftime? And what is it that you're going to do later in the game? What is your plan for uh, how Christian will say money time? You know, what is it that you're going to do, you know, in the last three, four, five minutes of the game? Because you can be winning a game through for the first 55 minutes. And if you lose it in the last, in the last five, you know, your job was, uh, um, and granted it could happen, but um, you have to be, um, you have to be very prepared in what is it that you expect uh, to do as a coach and what you expect from your team and your players to do at a late stage of the game. Okay. I divided this uh, and I divided normally uh, in three phases, before the game, during the game, and after the game. So before the game, I need to always look at what are the athletes that I have available and why that is that important? Because I give you an idea. Um, from 2008, from 2018, from May 2018, all the way to the, uh, to the actual um, intercontinental phase of the, of the IHF trophy, I have no lefties. So I have to create a, a tactical system that actually, you know, involved that, the fact that I didn't have a lefty. So my offensive system was developed around that, that fact. Then I, that ju I jump into uh, analyzing the, 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 uh, the rivals and see how my, I can find a correlation into my tactical system, okay? And what, what I have available to, what they were doing out there, okay? I always, you know, it, it's a, uh, I always created a concrete playbook. And the playbook is based on what I just said. Uh, the available athletes, while you have a task and um, the reality of your game, you know, or, or of your team. You know, I, I couldn't actually go in creating something really out of, uh, out of control or, or uh, realistic based on what I have. Another thing that I look into is the injuries. Who was actually ready? Who was that uh, um, uh, ready to play? Um, I am a very defensive coach. I, I it's a philosophical idea. Um, my ideology, you know, um, always stresses defense. And I tell you what, I believe that you can win a, a game with goals, but you win tournaments with defense. So. I always like to prepare, you know, my defense uh, very well um, because with a clear uh, defensive uh, system, you will be able to um, uh, be successful uh, throughout the entire, you know, competition. And, and everything is based also obviously in the analysis of the matches. And what I look, what I analyze, is not the play-by-play, -play, it's not the, uh, the actual uh, uh, organization, what I look is at, the, is at the tendencies. What is it that the, the team is doing when they're being successful? What is it what they're doing when they're not successful? What do they do in the beginning, mid, 
towards the end? What are the tactical um, uh, approaches that the coaches uses in separate parts of the game? And you'll see that eventually in one of the presentations. And once again, I'll go back to the clear understanding of my strengths and my weaknesses. What is it that I have that is important for me? How many Amars do I have? What, how, how can I actually uh, empower Amars, um, you know, uh, strengths just like Craig did uh, in, that, in that match so I can take, I can make the best off of him with the situation that I have. Next, okay. So then anal at the analysis previous to the game, um, I like to always look at the faces uh, versus the results in all available games. Why it, it, we were talking about that earlier during this presentation, the importance of off providing tasks during the phases. You know, what, what are the phases that, that the, the, the team is, is strong? What are the phases where they're, uh, you know, um, weak? And what is it that I need to do to actually hinder the, uh, that phase? I'll give you an example. What we did with Japan and World Championship, we shut them down uh, by basically creating, creating a, a, an offensive system that it was not as a hyperkinetic as, as theirs. So we put out a strong defense and we uh, delayed the tempo. We slowed down the tempo of the game and out of, out of the sudden they couldn't actually play uh, at the rhythm and that impacted uh, their performance really um, uh, highly. Um, another thing that is important for me, like Craig was saying earlier, the defense impact, impact zones. What is it that that synergy, what is it that that, that uh, collaboration between players is uh, weak? What is it that I need to actually uh, try to find uh, the finalization? And what are those spots in the defense that I need to basically um, uh, explore and exploit? Uh, individual performance, uh, who's doing well, who's not doing well. The goal is imp impact zones are important for me, not only for the preparation, but also for the uh, understanding of where we are. Uh, set plays versus outcomes. I want to see what is their go-to. I want to see what is their go-to play. What is it that they do, you know, when they are uh, um, uh, under pressure? I want to see how they excel under pressure. So that, that's one of the things that I like to look at. And obviously the special tactics, what, what, what the coach does uh, at the last, um, you know, last minute of the games, when they're in superiority, when they're in inferiority, you know, uh, when the, the, there's some type of balance in the uh, results. So those are the, the things that I like to look and, and present. And then the post uh, game analysis, as I mentioned to you in the performance and uh, uh, anxiety uh, presentation, I, I'm not that big into seeing what happened, you know, uh, at the very beginning. I like to see what went well and disregard the negative outcomes as much as I can. I like to do an emotional analysis. It's important, you know. Um, handball is a very uh, emotional uh, game. There's contact, is is fast, um, you know, fast pace, um, requires a lot of psychological uh, flexibility. And it's like uh, the emotional analysis is very important for me. I wanna know where the team is at, um, especially because, you know, for me, the performance anxiety is an uh, important factor in, um, in, in the development or performance of a team. So I always like to make sure that the performance, performance anxiety is low, so there's high performance. Physical analysis. Um, and uh, there's one thing that I learned from, from Christian, who's uh, one of my mentors, is that, you know, the uh, doctor is basically who makes the decision, not us. You know, if they say they're not ready, they're not ready. So uh, physical analysis is important because um, it will play an important role in, you know, uh, how you uh, coach a team. If you don't have that, if Amar was not ready for that match, Perhaps Craig wouldn't have the result that uh, that he had because he couldn't use it. So it's important. And all this is the most important one. And if you guys want to take one something uh, um, home today, what's important is the tactics versus the results correlation. You want to make sure that what you have actually planned has a correlation with the result that you're achieving. 
I'll give you an example. By ideology, by philosophy, my, my game approach will always be very defensive that progresses to a transitional game of counter attack so we can reward ourselves with easy goals. If I find at the end of the game that the vast majority of my goals came from set plays or processional play, uh, and I had a small percentage in terms of the counter attack, that means that my defense didn't work very well. So it is, imp- and, and this is just a broad uh, uh, example. Uh, obviously, there are so many complicating factors. This is why it's so important for me to um, um, decide what to do. Uh, key areas, plan and deliberate actions to really consistent performance is important. Actions to counteract effective with effective proactive or reactive actions to neutralize your opponent tactics based on a strong understanding of our opponent's team's experience in game phases, weaknesses, and strengths, the use of tactics during the tournament and season. So it is important for me that we look at that. Now, at what point of the game we change the tactics? Craig talked a little bit about it. I'm going to talk a little bit about it. Uh, is it a player or a team uh, issue? If it's a player, you know, maybe talk to the players, see what's going on, or do a, a quick substitution. But don't change the tactics because things are not are, are not working because potentially it's just something that is not working in that synergy, okay? And also pay attention to the other team's tactics. Uh, when do I change a player if it's not executing plan tactics? Number one, below uh, average performance, physical condition, we were talking about fatigue, how important is that? And for me, also the emotional part of it. If he's out of control, he's out. Okay, well, when do I ask for a timeout? to provide clear instructions or uh, about a tactical change, to emphasize the other team's uh, weaknesses, to stop a large number of athletes, to break the rhythm, to control a passive game, can be psychological timeout or to hydrate. Rushing through this because I know that this time uh, we're in tight <laughs> yeah, construction. <laughs> and then yes. we're just going to wrap up with a summation right. of this, understanding the game as a coach. And it's just, it's very important yeah. to understand improving gameplay is the central preoccupation of coaching and training, development, preparation, and competition. Competition, In all uh, play-related t- contexts, it's, it's the central preoccupation. The objects of the game for all phases are essential objects of the game in training and developing, for, and developing teams for competition. And a game plan is only as good as a coach's ability to understand her players, to read the gameplay, and to adjust accordingly. And now I'm not going to, we're not going to take any questions right now because we have a really important speaker about to uh, start up. I'm going to uh, unshare my screen. So August Thorkelson of XPS and Sideline Sports, which all of you should know if you are a USA team handball member, we have a contract with them. You can use this uh, software uh, as part of the deal that they have with uh, that we have with XPS and, and I've worked with August for years and he's just a really important guy to hear about how to develop tool or how to, how to use tools to help you develop as a coach. All right. Thank you, Craig, for the Thank nice you. words. <laughs> so uh, everyone, uh, I'm glad to be here. Uh, Thank you for inviting me to this. So my name is August Torkelson. I'm the CEO of Sideline Sports and I'm going to give a quick yeah, presentation of uh, what we do and how we can help handball coaches and clubs. Um, so I can share my screen, um, Craig? Let's see. Yes, you can share your screen. There we go. All panelists can share. Uh, let's see, let's see, let's see. Okay. Sideshow here. And then I start sharing. Okay, I'm sharing another screen here. So I'll just stop my video in the meantime um so everybody sees my do you see my screen here craig yes Yes. okay there we go so uh our product is called xps network and um, it's basically a coaching software platform for planning analysis and communication and uh, i'm going to uh, well, there are two things that I'm going to talk about here today. It's about how XPS can help the individual coach in his or her daily work. And then I'm going to talk uh, about how XPS can help clubs to uh, 
to build up their programs and how you can use XPS to, to uh, just strengthen all systems in, in the clubs. Uh, that has to do with IT. And before we go there, let me just say a few, uh, yeah, give a little background about the company. So basically we've been around since 2001. Um, we, are, we have now 1500 clubs around the world in uh, various sports. Uh, we are in 87 countries and um, yeah, we have a, quite a bit of athletes and coaches using this now. Now, since we're a Nordic company, uh, our roots are Icelandic and Swedish. Uh, handball is very close to our heart. It's, uh, I'm Icelandic myself and uh, we are quite proud of our handball team, which is the, uh, the most popular national team in Iceland. And uh, but we now work with 24 handball associations around the world on different levels. It's uh, some associations use it for the national team work and some go all the way and use it in uh, coaching education and, and so on, like USA Team Handball. Um, so let me talk about the platform. And now I'm going to show a video where I'm just going to go through the, uh, the different things. And I'm going to start by talking about the advantages XPS uh, has for a coach, an individual coach. Now, our main thing is probably that we have everything in one place. And um, let me not just get the video up here. Okay, I guess we have to do this uh, here. Okay. And this is about uh, helping the coach be more, uh, so we talk about being more efficient and being more effective. So if we start by talking about the efficiency, it's about helping the coach in their daily work uh, to make them more efficient or save time while doing your planning, your practice planning, drawing up tactics, working with video, uh, communicating within the coaching staff or with the players, and basically uh, having everything in one place. Um, not just in the computer, also at your fingertips in the in the mobile phone. So, uh, and that has to do with building up your uh, your drill database uh, with videos, uh, animations, diagrams. So this is all part of the same platform. Doing the strength and conditioning because uh, as I've been. Uh, Seeing in some of the other presentations, uh, these are things that you know, we, we can use XPS in a club where maybe there are people uh, where you have uh, strength and conditioning coach and different type of coaches and so on. But often it is the, the fact that a coach is doing a lot of this, uh, you know, by himself. So, uh, but then at least you have the support in the XPS platform to be able to uh, also send out workouts, individual workouts and, uh, and so on. Uh, the planning, it's, uh, it's all in here. You have it all in a very nice calendar. We try to keep the platform as simple as possible. Even if you can do a lot of things in it, it uh, it's very important that you can do it fast. So here's an example of how easy it is to uh, plan a practice. So you just, uh, if you have the drills, if you don't have them, you build them up, but then it's drag and drop, or you do it straight from the phone. And uh, because everything you see here is available on your phone as well. Um, so we'll just keep going with this. And so these things are about, about, about the efficiency, but now, Let's talk a little bit about uh, also doing the right things, right? So being, being effective. The platform gives you, just by you doing the practice planning and, and so on, it gives the coach the ability to reflect on what have they been doing. So you have a record of everything that has been done in practice, for example, and also your analysis of uh, matches. And now you can go back and see statistics about what were you spending your time on and comparing it to, uh, 
to actual results. So, uh, and it's as easy as it's two mouse clicks and you can start uh, digging down into uh, all kinds of data and you get automatic reports for, uh, for these things. We also have the video and again, you can use XPS in many different ways. And it's not about, you don't, nobody starts using everything from day one. I mean, it's easy to get started, but once you have the need for uh, different things, they are there for you. And video is one of them. And very easy to, uh, to tag video, uh, draw on video clips, share it with players and get different sorts of analysis or do your uh, video presentations and, uh, and so on. Okay. And maybe the last part I'm going to show here is um, then you get to more advanced uh, features like the, the, the reports where you can basically get a report about any data that you are accumulating. And you can send out uh, questionnaires and forms to players automatically for things such as uh, monitoring, readiness, training load, and so on. One thing that many teams have been using lately uh, are the COVID-19 forms. I mean, these things are all very easy to, uh, to use in the platform. But of course, here we are at the, you know, now you're starting to use it in a quite a professional manner, but this is available to everybody now. Okay. And yeah, lastly, before I can maybe start talking a little bit about, uh, about the advantages for a club, uh, let me just show the mobile app. So we'll go over here. Okay. And so here's the mobile app. Um, and basically everything, you, you can plan your practice in here. It's, uh, it's as easy as pressing the plus here. Click on uh, new team practice. You can select from various templates that you have access to, uh, or you just create one from scratch. I'm going to create one for my XPS team here. And you have access to the, uh, the drill collection that might be being built up in the club. So everybody is building up a common uh, knowledge base. And, uh, or you're just a single coach using this for yourself. And so here I have some uh, handball drills. I'm just going to press on the pluses here. And let's drag one over here. Okay, so here I've selected a few drills. Now I can go in here and uh, put in the minutes. Yeah, this will be a short practice. Maybe I want to split up the, uh, the practice at some point and one of, the, one of the group of players will do this and another one will do something else. And I can put in info and labels and where is it and all of these things, but now I'm finished, okay? Now, of course, I'm going to have a attendance for this and uh, so all of these things are here, but now we're talking about it takes a minute to put in your practice plan. If you have the drills, if I would have been missing drills, I could have created them on the fly. And then you have uh, all videos and diagrams and coaching points right here. And this can be shared so you can decide that the players can see this uh, before they arrive. If you want them to uh, prepare mentally before, or you can decide if it's a tough practice with a lot of running, you might decide not to show it to them. It's, it's your choice as a coach. Um, this is available to the whole coaching staff. Uh, like everything else, I can go here to uh, look at my, all of my different templates and, uh, and collection. I can assign this to players. Let's say I have a player I just want to share one drill with that uh, something that can be done maybe on their own. So I can go in here. Now I can just click on share and send this either to a group or a, or a player. And they will receive this on their mobile. Okay. Um, 
everything here, statistics that I'll show you, it's, it's all here on the mobile as well. So to talk about the club, um, the advantages for a club, they're a little bit different than the advantages for a, for a single coach. But for the club, this is about building up your program in a systematic way. And uh, I usually talk about uh, or like to compare clubs to uh, small or even large businesses. Uh, in today's world, it's, it's impossible to run uh, any small business or club without the help of computer systems if you're going to really do it well. And, and now there is a system available for the sport aspect. Uh, where you can really build up all of your knowledge bases. You can implement your coaching philosophy in here. Um, decide what you want to focus on, what you are teaching the players and how, and then be able to analyze, are you, you know, is it working as you want it to be? Are you getting the results that you're looking for? Um, we're a little bit getting away from the days where... <coughs> where uh, a coach comes into a club and uh, <coughs> excuse me, maybe you get a coach into the club, a great coach who stays with the club for two years and then he moves on and takes his binder with him and nothing is left. But now instead you can get them into XPS and you can have a record of what they've done and you know what they've been contributing to the club and, uh, and so on. So it's really, a, it's a revolution for clubs and this is why we're having a lot of clubs sign up all over the world. Um, let's see. Yeah, and for the coaching education in the club, it's just so nice for, especially new coaches coming into a club where there has been built up a base of this, uh, where you have everything. It's so easy for them to get access to it easy for you to, to show them and, uh, and just help the, the new coaches uh, improve by sharing knowledge from the, the, the coaches who have been there. Um, yeah, this was just my few minutes overview of XPS. Uh, Craig, do you want to open yeah. for questions? Yeah, no, I, I, every, anybody wants to ask a question, I have some questions for you. Um, uh, that I consider because I understand the software well, uh, because I've worked with you in the, uh, you know, for the, you know, since 2015, 16, I think it was since when I started, you know, using XPS and then started working with you and then started really kind of using it at a higher level. I'm curious about a couple things. Um, what happens if a coach is part of a club and leaves that you said the club holds on to that, but the, does the coach take the, the system that he builds or she builds? builds with him as well is there like two factions now of it yeah and this the, is the uh, this are, is a good question uh, you you think as a co i mean this is what the coaches are thinking about <laughs> and this is a i know i mean this is great this is why it's called xps network really um i can show here if i go to uh, to my live xps here so every coach has their own personal account Okay, so and then they're using that account to work inside here. I'm working inside Sideline Sports, but I also have my own personal account. So obviously, this is going to be a, this is going to be an agreement between the club and the coach. But most clubs give the coaches the ability to everything that they've contributed, they take it with them when they go on, maybe to somewhere else. So yes, that's uh, we. This is why we have coaches <laughs> it, using XPS for for twenty years. Yeah, because they're always building up their own things. Coaching, coaching's a funny, um, esoteric art where you feel very you're, you you feel very protective in one sense. Like I always loved the streamlined aspect of XPS and I always was horrified by the simple, I mean, as a person who writes books, it's so, we, I, I found my book on two academic websites in Europe and 
never had, they never paid never took a permission they're using it in school and it was like how the ease of the electronics you know yeah. like it's awesome that you have it up but as coaches we feel very protective because otherwise if everybody does what we do we don't have a job <laughs> so so it's uh, you know but, but, but like i like to say i mean you can buy a recipe book from a master <laughs> chef right <laughs> yeah no no and i say it i said it yesterday i said it yesterday you can know all the drills in the world, but if you don't know how to That's order it. them properly and link them to development, you're lost. That's it. That's you just it. show up I, and you do random stuff. Yeah. I have a testimony, a testimonial for for the membership, so they can understand a little bit, uh, uh, a little bit how how important SPS can be. And I'm and I, in my perspective, was very skeptical. Um, well, first of all, I don't think there's any questions, Craig. You might look and see. Yeah, I was while looking. I, while no, I, um, I have one more. How important SPS can be uh, in the development of a team? Uh, I was introduced to SPS in 2017 by Craig. Okay, at that point, I have already spent like three years learning to work with Dar Fish because uh, Christian required for me to learn it, and I hated it at the beginning. So finally, I learned to work with it, and I'm starting to fall in love, and I'm loving everything. And here comes SPS. I'm like, oh man, I don't have time for this. I, I have already learned. I have already learned, you know, <laughs> this. I'm I'm becoming pro, proficient in in, in darfish, and now I need to learn uh, SPS, right? So I, I'll do it. I jump the wagon. I believe you. You know, I have the conversation with uh, August as uh, August as well, and then I got called by Colombia. And Colombia's like, hey, you know, we need you to take over this this tournament. Uh, but we don't have, we cannot bring you here other than preparation. I'm like, I think I have the, the tool for this. I'm, I, I'm like three weeks into it, but I think I'm going to give it a try. Okay. So I was able to plan everything for Colombia from LA. Mm -hmm. So I was like sharing everything with the assistant coach and the players. And uh, very simple because I wasn't as sophisticated as, as Craig is. Um, and I, and I saw the results. We were able, when I got there, everybody was on the same page because of what I, I, I worked, um, what I learned, what I did with SPS. I fast tracked this to now, to today, okay. to maybe a couple of weeks ago, I, I texted him, I'm, I'm, I texted Craig out of, out of an aha moment. He did. Because <laughs> I'm, now, I, I'm, now, I'm now working with SPS with the men's uh, national team and how I'm tracking everything. And I texted him, you don't understand how much in love I am with XPS right now. Oh, man. It's so nice to hear. It's worth my heart. He is Cuban, so he, they fall in love easy. No, and I guess I, guess I want to bring it back. Thank you, Julio. It's really nice to hear this. I want to bring it back to one final question for you. For our yes. USA-based coaches and for the coaches mm -hmm. also attending, what are, what's, the first what's the first step to starting it? Is it just going on the computer and downloading it and getting used to it? If they're a USA coach and they have it as part of our deal with you, what is that process like? And then we'll finish yes. up. We'll so it. everyone who is part of the, the USA team handball should have access to it. And if not, just, just uh, email the uh, association and, and they will connect uh, you with me at the end and so on. Um, and if you're somewhere else, uh, go to the sidelinesports.com website and sign up for a trial. And uh, then it's, it's really easy to get started. We uh, takes takes a few minutes to get started, really. Well, you we, just have to decide what you want yeah. to focus on, right? And, and I guess I'll leave it at this. And as part of my inviting you here today is I know how important a tool it is for coaching because it's, it's a difficult job and any job that makes us more focused on our players and less focused on administration makes us happy. <laughs> There's a yes. little bit of onboarding with bringing your whatever random stacks of paper you have, whatever loose ideas you have and that, but I can recommend to every coach, it's so important and valuable to get in it, start using it and build the pieces that work for you and disregard the others. And then when you need them, add them in. And so I really appreciate you being here today, August. I, I've appreciated working with you and I'm really excited that you have signed with USA Team Handball and that we have a collaboration with you for the next three years. So thank you for coming. Thank today. you very much. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Okay, guys. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.
Um, everybody else, why don't we take, we went um, four minutes over. Let's take five minutes uh, break at 11.10. We'll come back on uh, for my lecture on tactics uh, in attack and uh, counterattack. So thanks everyone. Hey everybody, sorry for that brief delay. Um, I had to take care of something uh, to get us set up. Um, just checking, make sure we're on. Um, hi everyone, uh, I want to uh, start talking right now about uh, tactics in attack and counterattack. Uh, the original uh, lecture I had planned for this was more of a analysis of uh, tactics in situations. And I, after yesterday, um, seeing the questions asked, seeing where we went with yesterday's lecture, I got up very early this morning and <laughs> wrote out a new lecture, a new curriculum for today in this module or in this specific one, um, because I really want us to focus on and attach my lecture on the foundational progressive and advanced technical skills in a way that uh, shows development in handball 
and shows development of uh, tactics in a similar fashion to the technical skills that players uh, uh, acquire. And it's really important for me to say that it's not about, um, or it's uh, uh, learning tactics is essential in development. And I want to show you the development process of tactical gameplay. And from there, you can interpret where your club or team is at. And from that, you can uh, step in where it's needed. But I'm going to start with the beginning and end with that. But I'm going to start first um, by focusing on uh, understanding of phases of counterattack. Um, in counterattack, we call it fast break. Uh, but there's really three phases of counterattack. There's a simple fast break. There's the extended fast break. And there's the complete fast break. Um, game play, gameplay development in simple fast break at the foundational level is a direct long pass from goalie or primary player to forward attacker. Uh, a primary player is someone after a turnover. A goalie is a player after a save leading the attack. Um, a progressive tactical skill is indirect long pass from supporting player to forward player. And then advanced self pass, you see it in the textbooks, you don't see it in games. So I'm not really gonna discuss it or touch it right now. Um, here's a video of, uh, of the simple fast break. After a save, very simple, long. And actually I love this, this video because it shows you a technique, an advanced technique, a reverse spin shot. Very nice shot. And so in simple fast break, it's the easiest way to score in handball. The easiest. The outside defender, usually a wing, releases when that shot goes up and is gone and the, and the goalkeeper has already seen him. Tactics in extended fast break. When in numerical superiority, using width and depth to isolate defenders, gave favorable space and pass up to the open attacker. When in numerical equality, using crosses with and without the ball to force defenders to make decisions. Connect with players in the first wave. Now, this is an important part. Extended fast break, it would be like the goalie on the save, seeing that the, the first person is defended and passes to a nearer player to the goalie and they work their way up in still in disorganized fashion because they're trying to beat the defense, but it's still, um, it's not the fast break. It has some structure to it. But again, if you have two V two, so if there's two players against two players, you want to cross. If there's three players versus two players spread apart, one of the defenders is left, uh, or one of the players is the attackers is left open. And that's the person you choose. And we're going to parallel that in a little bit when I talk more about attacks and or tactics and counterattack or attack. Uh, here's the sample of extended fast break, block, sorting it through to the lead, back to the lead attacker. Very nice shot. Okay. So in fast break, you, you get, we have to see that we want to use the disorganization that's naturally in the retreat against them. It's the easiest way to score. I showed it in that opening uh, uh, about spaces of greatest value. Uh, look at that. There's so much opening. You could, the number 11 on the opposite side could have had it. Okay. It's really important to understand with fast break, with tactics and fast break, that it's really about getting the ball moving forward, finding space. The complete fast break is a different thing altogether. The complete fast break has the character and style maybe of the set positions, except there is no pause to reorganize um, for the, hold on. Um, there's no pause to reorganize for the uh, uh, defense to, uh, no pause to let the defense reorganize. And so you're uh, basically applying uh, uh, organized offensive tactics against a malformed defense meaning the outside defender had been cutting had been trailing a, uh, a wing and ends up in the middle so there's likely a uh, through shot opportunity with the backcourt player so players occupy positions against temporary defense with great pressure the first effort needs to be made as a breakthrough with backcourt players the the first wave has already pushed uh, the depth part has brought the defense back to the line. They're malformed. There's openings. The first look is to the breakthrough attempt. The second look is through is at a uh, through shot. 
And then the third effort is to connect then with uh, line players, meaning the wings or the pivot. Now, this is important to understand when we later talk about uh, tactical games and different things, that these parts, these, these are elements that you can build into progressive uh, uh, games in which the, the, the object of the game can be solve the complete fast break with only a breakthrough by a backcourt player or solve it. And so you can think about it in such a way as that it's tactical, but it's also structural as we go forward. There's organized attack, there's maintaining threat and more organized attack is so essential. You maintain backcourt threat, meaning width and depth, maintaining wing threat width and maintaining pivot threat depth. But the core place, the, the, the synergy is when you have a team that maintains all three threats at once. And that was what Coach Robert Hayden talked about yesterday in his session of what he was looking for in players. He talked about how he liked to have a backcourt that was active and he liked uh, big, hard throwing shooters and a dynamic interplaying uh, center back. He liked wings that could shoot the lights out, he said run the fast break, but when they're in positional play, they could, they could unleash the guns on the, on the goal. And so that's important to understand this, this width and depth, but also being, being focused on creating teams that are, that have the uh, intent of pushing and pushing and pushing. Okay. Now there's three types of attack. Okay. And this is important. This is, I'm going to talk. So this is where my, my, my last lecture that I had planned uh, now turned the other way. Okay. Before I was going to talk about each situation and give uh, and, and present had really worked out some really good videos, which when you become, when you work on certification with us later, they will all be part of that. I broke down the game in such a way, but I don't want to talk about that because I think it's important for us since we're talking about development to talk about developing tactical concepts in attack and counterattack. There's three types of attack. There's a mobile attack, which means free movement of players, which means there's no structure to it. There are, um, uh, it, it's, it's what ch children would play. It re resembles that. Uh, fixed play, which is a strict positional gameplay in zones. And I'm going to have graphics for this in a second. And then there's combined play, which is a modern gameplay, which means you occupy a relative zone. So if I'm the left back, I know I operate in a certain space, but it's not my only space. I'm not confined to that space. And good tactics will bring me into other spaces to also attack into other zones. And so that's the combined attack. Okay, and so what I really want to look at first is gameplay development and attack. Okay, so this is development stuff. This is development 101. This is this first foundational part of gameplay and mobile attack is really what the uh, essence of children's handball is. And that's free movement in a superiority situation. A 4v3 plus goalkeeper it means the goalkeeper comes forward. There's only three defenders and there's four attackers. The goal is undefended but you have four attackers pushing forward. And so the sole obligation of that situation and that dynamic is to find the open player. Just like I talked about in, in extended fast break, the same principle. Extended fast break is basically, if they had, were developed correctly, the, was, was the 4v3 plus goalkeeper or maybe 3v2 plus goalkeeper, whichever way you want to look at it. But in a basic game form, this is an important one to learn. And that's at its base. But it teaches all sorts of individual 1v1 skills. It teaches uh, the very beginning of joint technical actions. And so at that form, that foundational play is important. Uh, progressive of that for the mobile uh, type of attack is a free movement in numerical equality against full court press. So the same principles apply. The defenders are looking for offensive players, except there's not the superiority. Okay. You went from having an open person to having to create space. And that's a huge piece. That's, that's the second major point in it. The first, the first step is identifying space and finding it. The second is creating it. And in, in the same way that there's the trial and error, when I talked about the development of skills, they have to play with it at first. They have to understand the limitations and they have to understand where to go next. They need to understand how to start to link up because one, one player can't do it alone. So they have to learn, you know, how to, I always say to the kids, catch, catch and move, uh, uh, pass and move. If you're always, <laughs> it means you're always moving. I never shut up about that in practice or, or classes with kids because it's important. And then the advance for mobile 
is free movement inequality against mix zone defense. So now here's the first provocation. So now we have two defenders play, marking out front, finding who they can, and two fixed in zone in the back. So now the defense learns and the offense learns. I have to first beat the first line to then beat the second line. So we basically are twice having to have penetration phases where you have to penetrate the first line and then penetrate the second line. Now that comes in play in, uh, very largely when we discuss uh, maybe in more depth uh, how to beat uh, 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 mix zone defenses like a 5-1 or a 4-2. Same concept. You have to beat the first group to then beat the second group. Second group's easier. The, sec the first group's harder because of the rules and restrictions on that. But that's mobile attack. And so this free form shape against it is the first stage. Then we come to fixed. So now we're learning fixed. Now I have a pivot here, but there shouldn't be a pivot and there shouldn't be a wing player and there should be only four zones for kids. If we were teaching kids, we would have four relative zones and it's against a flat defense and it's 4v4 plus goalkeeper. And then kids start to learn one-on-one -on -one moves in a more coordinated pattern, but learn how to work in space. There's all sorts of rotation rules you can add. If I was the outside attacker, I go to inside defender. If I'm inside, in, inside defender, I come back to inside attack. And you rotate through. There's all sorts of rotation rules you can add for players, and it's important. But it's, again, now you're learning how to operate in space and attack 1v1 in a more structured uh, situation, which is resembles handball. And then for fixed, the second level progressive is fixed attack in zones against a flat defense with a pivot. Now you're working on joint technical actions. You may have been in the previous one in the foundational using piston passing in and out to exchange the ball between zones, but now you have a pivot who enters the zones to work with you, set up blocks, sets up screens, that's and other things like that. And then you go to the advanced, which is the fixed attack against in zones or fixed attack in zones against flat defense with pivot. So this is what we, we see against here. It's a fixed attack. We're in the structure, but now the, the pivot can move within it, okay? Can move through everything. And that's what's important. Okay, now we go to combined. And this is now we're starting to have this. So we went from, we went from seeking out space to creating space to uh, creating two or defeating two lines to net the second grouping was first understanding 1v1 technical and then 1v1 technical with support. Now we're in the combined aspect. So now you have gameplay and development and attack combined. You have foundational, which is a combined attack with backcourt switching zones against a flat defense. Okay. So the it's, it's important. Then you have a combined attack with backcourt and pivot switching zones against mixed defense. So now the mixed defense. So first you, attack, you teach them to attack a flat defense and now a mixed defense. The mixed defense could be a, a two line zone or it could be a five plus one, meaning you're man marking, which means one defender is, is playing man to man against one player on the other team or in the zone concept, one player's out front disrupting collaboration. It's important to beat that. And then the, the final one is to add the wings in. So it starts with just a combined attack with the backcourt switching zones. So the backcourt is the players responsible for switching zones. Then the second level is the backcourt and the pivot switching zones. And then the third is the backcourt's wings and pivot against a flexible defense. And that's important to understand. That's the modern game right there. That's how you develop the modern game. Now, the truth about development and attack, the defensive form, this is, if there's a slide, I can, if there's a slide, you take a picture in your mind or a screenshot on your computer, it's this one. The defensive formation and strategy dictates the tactical structure and attack. The defensive formation and strategy dictates the tactical structure in defense in attack. All major developmental progressions in attack directly correspond to defensive progressions in formation and strategy. But successful development and attack necessitates a new approach on defense. This is the reciprocal relationship. Once the attack can solve the open space problem, the defense is, is, is it's impossible to defend. There's no reason to keep training it. You move to the next level. Now solve uh, numerical equality with, with four players, four court players against four court players and create the space. Once they learn to create the space, because remember four players on the court versus four players on the court is only eight. There's much more space to contend for. 
If it's six V six, there's limited space, which means it's not as easy, but they're all in relationship. And when the offense solves it, the defense must. And this is both a developmental process and a tactical process for game planning in a game as a coach. Once the offense has solved my defense, it is on me to change it. Otherwise I'm victim. And if my defense is working, it's up to the offense to change what they're doing until they can solve me. But it's a reciprocal relationship. They interact. Attack against man-to-man -man defense. So now we're gonna take what we understand. So we now know. And so we look at man-to-man -man defense. Foundational, unstructured mobile play relying on individual technical skills with the goalkeeper supporting attack. Progressive, unstructured mobile play relying on individual technical skills and joint technical skills. These are things we talked about yesterday. So at the, at the base level, you need superiority to solve the problem. And once you learn how to do that every time, you then move forward to learning how to then include, and this is all development. And then advance is structured and coordinated mobile play. So the first, the first tactical um, synergy that happens is in this advanced stage of, of, of attack against man-to-man. And this is what's important because it's, it's learning to do structured and coordinated moves. Uh, and that's where the wave system begins. Uh, 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 Coach Robert said yesterday, he likes a first, second and third wave, which is a simple extended and com uh, complete fast break. The first form of waves happens in this advanced stage against man to man. It's where they, the, the, it's the first click, the light that goes on because they start to realize they need to support each other and they create groups. One group goes forward to spread uh, for depth and one group works to create spaces with either blocking or screening with goal for goal moves um, and supporting waves. It's just important at this stage. Against the flat zone. So now we're looking at more and we start with four defenders, five defenders. Uh, it's fixed play without pivot, developing individual technical skills relying on waving to initiate the attack. Now, waving is different than first waves, and I'll have a graphic for it for you in a minute. But waving is an important skill at this stage to learn, or important tactic, tactical skill to learn. It basically means the left wing or right wing initiates the attack inside the gap between the outside and the half defender. Uh, progressive to this is fixed play. So again, fixed play. Uh, st st we're structured in space with pivots working on utilizing joint technical skills in primary and supporting zones. Now we wanna see the zone that I'm in is also related to the zones next to me. They're supporting me. And this is gonna be important for understanding partial game forms. And then advanced is combined play with pivot working on small group collaborations in primary and supporting zones. Now this is important, combined play means you're playing with uh, uh, players in their zones and players moving out of their zones with pivot working on small group collaborations in primary and supporting. Attack against mixed or offensive zone defense is the foundational is combined play, relying on small group collaborations. That's the first level to defeat this, is you really, you, you, you basically reduce yourself. The individual doesn't work, but you have to work on small groups. And then the second step is combined play, relying on individual technical and tactical skills, joint technical skills, and small group collaborations. Meaning you're really focused on the uh, you're on a pre-coordinated concept, you know, we'll say the pivot comes, the pivot sets back, back block on forward defender. And from there, that initiates a whole chain of, of, uh, problems and resolutions that either result in a turnover or a goal. And then there's the advance, which is the combined play relying on techno tactical strategy, uh, a team that's in its place can take on anything and know what to do. And it's your job as a coach to prepare, 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 and provide them all the tools so there's nothing they can't face that they can't defeat, especially in attack, because the defense has less rules uh, governing them and, are, and you're the one that has to dictate it. So here I'm going to look at. So I think this is an important one. This defense is a 5-1. This was a strategic moment in the game because the forward defender there is going to this player right here is going to dictate the terms of everything for the rest of the game. For the next 25 minutes, he's going to harass the offense. But I want you to pay attention to two things. Watch the offensive players speak to each other. 
They already are knowing what they need to do and what they have to do, uh, what they're going to need to do and plan in the sequence. This is what small group collaboration looks like when the, when the, uh, when the problem arises, they just talk it out. There's no coach here telling them what to do. There's no coach yelling it here. The offense is, is talking to each other. Watch they're discussing, telling them, this is what I'm going to do. Look, he even did hand signals and gave them a thumbs up. They're coordinating. That's a small group collaboration. They're trying to defeat one of the best forward defenders in the game. Watch, watch the forward defender disrupt every collaboration, always in the passing lanes, always in the passing lanes, always managing them. Watch it goes to the wing, comes back out. Now he cuts off the backcourt player. Now he cuts off the other one, comes back in and gives support. We didn't really get to get in, uh, but he was trying to spin the ball out of the hand. That's an advanced technique on defense. It's not a foul. Now he's now he knows that he knows that the small group collaboration, the number five who went on the ground, he gets a warning here. He knows it's a small group collaboration. He knows they planned something and he's harassing it to stop it. But the offensive player is doing his job. And this is something we're never going to get into in this speech or in this lecture series this week. But something that this pivot does right here is brilliant. He engages them, makes them fight, makes them exaggerate the fight. That is a tactical skill and it's brilliant because he earned a two minute penalty. That's added value. And so attack, that's a resolution. So they just solved their problem. They couldn't do it by bring, bring, getting the forward defender out, but they're smart enough to know it. They were smart enough to know they had to engage him and, and exaggerate his influence on the game because they didn't stand a chance without him. And in the end, they lose this game because of him. It was a master class of forward defense by uh, number five there, Damiak. Attack and numerical support superiority. Now, this is a key thing I want to discuss right now. This is because this is the first stage of of learning, but this is this is also something that gets replicated. Because so in uh, open space, remember, you, in, and if you develop a player properly, they'll always remember in superiority, their goal is to find the open space. Foundational is fixed play by waving, which I'll show you on a graphic, without pivot searching for final solution. Second stage is fixed play by waving with pivot, which I'll show you, searching for final solution. And then the advanced is fixed play with two pivots and two backcourts searching for solution. Now, this is interesting because it relates to what I'm going to talk about later today. But what's interesting about the fixed play with two pivots is I call it rodeo and I tell my guys to get to work. I don't waste, don't waste passes. Don't do anything. Get down there. Don't try to do a buildup phase in which then the backcourt player goes in and goes straight to work. I have a tactical pivot and I have another in the Scandinavian position and get to work because I have a 4v3 and a 3v2. And it's the decision of the two backcourt players to decide which one is favorable and when. And they just keep passing back and forth until it presents itself. And then they make the final solution. And you can see it here. The waving is the initiation on the side the, the between the uh, outside defender and the half defender. You've already got numerical superiority. Passes to the next player. You have a pivot pl placing the block here. Now it's, now it's a strong move here because now we have uh, one player, two player, three player, four player, five player against three. We've already created the problem for them. And it's all about seeking out the space. At one point, they're going to run out of defenders or make a bad choice. That's always your goal in numerical superiority. Have them run out of defenders or make a wrong choice. If this guy passes to him and he pass fakes here and he goes this way, you just cut through and it's the breakthrough. But it's always the high percentage shot you, you seek in superiority. That's a tactical concern. If your player shoot an out, shoots an outside shot right here over the block, you pull that player off the court and sit them down and remind them how the sport is played because they missed the development stage that said, seek the open space when in superiority, seek it. They don't have to create it. They just have to find it. And it's usually three passes away, two passes away. It, it just depends on what the defender does. Attack and numerical inferior. Oh, wait, let me go back. Let me go back. Sorry. I went ahead too much. I got all excited. Now rodeo, two pivots. Rodeo's classic. Dan go look at the Danish women in the wor world championships. They go straight to work. They run rodeo. Rodeo, two pivots, two line play or two wings and two backcourt players. You can see the solution. You have you have a 3v2 right here. 
I create another 3v2 right here. And it's just choosing which you want. If this player comes to support this one, the pass to here is now they have more space. This is massive pressure on this inside defender. If this ball carrier comes here to pass and he comes out, it's a simple pass to here. If this uh, outside defender uh, fronts, plays, plays player defense or man defense, you go to the wing. It's just about seeking solutions. And it's always the open solution. The only solution in tactical superiority is, is the uh, uh, open person. But the 7v6, new 7v6 and rules of the goalkeeper have ruined the statistics show. And I'm going to gripe here a second because the statistics show that tactically speaking, 7v6 has lessened the uh, effect of being in superiority and minimized the damage done for uh, uh, bad acts. So I can be more rough because I know, because my goalkeeper now can come out, that they're never really, yes, we're vulnerable, but like kids, they, it's the same concept. They were vulnerable too. But in this case, it's ruined the... It's ruined the the call. It's ruined the benefit for the team in superiority and minimize the expense for the team in inferiority. It's important to understand. And then in inferiority, it's combined at the foundational level. It's combined play with pivot, relying on individual technical and tactical skills and joint technical skills to find solution. It's really it's because the defense has the advantage when you are down a man. But in the inferiority, like I said, the modern game is you pull your goalie and you bring it forward. But I'm talking developmentally speaking. And I'm speaking that in times in, in the club level, you will see this a lot. You know, most teams will pull the pivot out. This is what I'm talking about at the foundation level. I have five backcourt players and I'm playing without, and they, they try to. In that case, you, you have to use uh, joint technical skills and you also have to use waving, but only if you can create a mistake. Combined play with pivot, relying on a small group collaboration is the second level. Now you add the pivot. Now you add the pivot and run with out a wing, and you now have a tactical solution that you can create by being uh, strong with your pivot to hold back the line. Your your pivot is not there to 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 disappear. Your pivot's there to play a role in that case. And then advanced is combined play with pivot, relying on techno technical synergy to find solution. It all goes back to small groups. If I put my pivot, if I'm down a person and I put my pivot between the outside defender and the half defender, I've got a 3v2 that no one can, that it's a very tight one. If I have a wing that can shoot a, a, a minimal angle shot and a pivot who can shoot from the angle, the, the long angle, I'm perfect. I, I can resolve that. That big number 16 from my last lecture, the pivot that had nine goals, he, he is built for this. A cannon of an arm can roll back and choose to do the lean dive shot and hit the near post, and it's perfect. But you have to have the players to do it. And if you don't, it's more about uh, structuring your time to be to waste as much time as possible. Go 25 seconds in, call a timeout. Go 25 seconds in. You know, there's strategic parts to it and tactical parts that timeout can play with that. Go right before forewarning for passive play, call a timeout. And you get a whole nother cycle. It's really important to understand an inferiority. And then we have overview of tactics from attack and free throw, uh, from the free throw situation. Then this is important. This is a tactic at the first level, free throw, restart. I get, I go into shoot, I get wrapped up and they bring me back out and I got a, a, my pivot resets at the nine meter line. There's two basic foundations you have to begin with. Reorganization and quick attack. Reorganization simply means we're going to start again. I'm going to pass to the backcourt player and it begins again. Quick attack is a first level thing that they need to learn. They need to learn the, they can take, the defense is malformed. The pivot can go get the ball, come out quickly and toss to a backcourt player and do a 2v1 really fast. It's not a structured or planned 2v1, which we'll talk about, like a joint action, but this one is, is unstructured, but quick. It's the same concept as uh, uh, counterattack in that you're taking advantage of a moment of defenselessness of the defense. And then you have progressive, which is a fast throw off, uh, fast throw off, like after, uh, at, at the ha uh, after a goal is scored. Uh, the goalkeeper throws the ball out and yeah, we gave up a score, but we're going to move it. And that free throw that happens at the center after that, it, it, it should be at speed. It should be the, the, the player initiating that with such speed and depth that you take away the 
retreat of the defense and you score a goal right away. Or there's joint technical or tactical actions, which I'm talking about. Like you can have one where the pivot uh, pivot throws to uh, uh, left back, left back goes to the out space, the weak side, and the center back crashes in under the pivot and you've got a numerical advantage created right away. And so there's, there's, and you can have, there's other joint actions that you can do and script and plan for. Those are the things you script and plan for. The quick attack are the things that you improvise. Sometimes it means the shot from the pivot. Sometimes the defense is arguing over a call with the referee, even though it's a live ball on the pivot can, I'm a pivot. I did it many times, takes a shot on goal because no one's paying attention. That that's, that's lacks structure and it's impulsive, but it's also a problem solving measure. The joint tactical one is usually a play we'll call where we know if the late, late game situation, this is what we're gonna run. And then you have advanced. What wall formation is important for the jump shot, especially the two footed jump shot. If you set up a wall, three, three players collapse back, that can be the basis. The threat of that alone can become a tactical action that wins situations because i don't have to throw to the player you could have a cutting player i can throw it to the guy next to me who turns and shoots on a dive shot and they think it's the jump shooter coming so there's many different ways and then at the end of half you have the uh the free the free, the shot on goal something you have to train for but it's not a high percentage shot but one of the things that i want to mention now is we had talked about the mixed uh, attack against mixed zone uh defense which is in the five plus one situation where a player is marked unmarking happens within the free throw and you have to train your players your pivots especially who reset to ask for three meters to get the space to get the time bring in the player that's marked into the zone and you might be able to form a small group collaboration immediately from that and get a shot opportunity that you didn't have before because the player was marked tactics on offense. I switched it up for you guys. <laughs> I thought it was better to talk about this, how things are developed instead of saying, this is what you should do. Because if you don't know how they're developed, doing them doesn't matter. It really doesn't. If you don't understand the, the, what your players are experiencing and only are focused on what they do, you'll never succeed as a coach. You have to understand the, the, the problems they're facing and the resolutions in front of them, which we'll talk about a little bit later, uh, also in depth. But the things I want you to consider, the development progression and attack tactics directly corresponds with the development of individual technical and joint tech, technical skills. All of this goes in order. It first goes individual technical skills, then it goes joint technical skills, then individual tactical, small group collaborations, and then synergy. It all is together. And then you have the tactical development, process is designed to create complete players and teams. The tactical development process is essential for creating complete players and teams. And to skip stages is to create incomplete players. And we'll discuss this more in modified pathways. Because it's a really important concept to understand that if you skip this stage, I have a player walk in and I've got an organized team and I throw him in at the wing and let him resolve the, he doesn't even know the game problem. He never learned uh, finding space. He never learned creating space. He, he missed a lot of steps and you have to understand how to help that player go through those steps. Because if you don't, you, you do not have a complete player. And, the, and your goal as a coach is to have complete players and the formation and plan and defense. This is the most important statement. Again, the formation and plan in defense dictates the tactics and attack, but successful attack strategy dictates changes in formation and plan and defense. Reciprocal relationship. It's a reciprocal relationship. Yes, defense chooses. And as a coach, you have to understand that. I, saw, I, prefer to, I prefer to look at what my opponents love to do and I rob them of that. My sole preoccupation is robbing them of what they love to do. And I'm gonna end that there and I'm gonna leave, uh, have Colleen step in. And Colleen is the president of Penn State's um, team, uh, college team, and she's gonna discuss uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And the, all right, I, let's let's first let me ask. Uh, sorry, before you come in, Colleen, um, I don't know if there's any questions. And I know Julio might not be on. Who was? I supposed am. To... I, I don't. Oh, see you any. are. Was there was there any questions? Do you have any um, questions for me, Julio? I don't have any at the moment. Okay, I think we should keep up with Colleen and keep us on task. So I'm going to have Colleen step in um, uh, right now. I'm going to stop my share. Hi, Colleen. How are Hi. you? Good, how are you? <laughs> Good. Welcome. I'll step out now and mute so you can have control of the uh, of the time. 
All right, sounds good. I'm gonna share my screen real quick. Um, I just need one person to tell me if you can see it. You're good. Okay, perfect. All right. Um, well, so hi everyone. Uh, my name is Colleen Reinhardt and I'm the president of the Women Club Team Handball at Penn State. Um, and so I just wanna share a few tips of, you know, how to start a team and how to keep it um, in a college. So um, I'll try to keep it short so we have time for questions. Um, and I wanted to start a little bit about the history of the club. Um, we were officially established, established in 2019. Um, but we actually started playing um, in fall 2016. It was just three girls who joined the men team who already existed. Um, and so as the semesters went by, you know, more and more members joined in. And as soon as we got above 10 members, we were able to create the club, hence its establishment in 2019. Um, and so you can see that we went from three to 30 members in like, what, if, like three years, not even. Um, and so that's a big, big progress for us. We were, we were even able to like get two teams um, last year, which was amazing. And that's when I joined actually. Um, and so we have a very diverse team and we were national champions in 2018 and the second runner up in 2019. All right, so those are like a few steps that I would recommend taking when um, starting a new club or considering starting a new club. The first, very first thing that you wanna do is talk to your competitive, competitive sports office or intramurals. But if you do intramurals, it's gonna stay within the, within the university most likely. And so you may not be able to um, play outside depending on the university. Um, and then the most important factors are money and membership. Um, you want to try and get money as fast and as much as possible um, through, you know, fundraisers, um, membership fee, um, and, and that kind of thing. And I'm going to talk a, a little bit about fundraising after. Um, you want to make sure, or I mean, you can and you should seek help from other teams within, within your university. Um, other sports team that have been established for a while and can guide you through the process. Um, and you can reach out to handball clubs in the US like us um, for questions that are you know, more handball related. Um, and then you wanna structure your club and think about what positions you want um, and whether or not you wanna be co-ed. Um, my advice about co-ed or not is that we started as a co-ed team um, and it's great to get started until you have enough members to make a, a full you know, um, team of women or men. Um, but handball is not a co-ed sport, so you want to try and step away from that as fast as possible, but keep you know, a healthy and, and friendly relationship between the two teams because uh, support is a big, big thing when you start a club. Um, and then you want to recruit players and keep them, and this is harder than it sounds. Um, and finally, you know, start playing, start practicing and organize your first tournaments. Um, and the way you do that is by, you know, reaching out to other, other schools um, and maintaining good relationships and communications with those schools. Um, and so for us, the first school that actually went, uh, came to Penn State uh, for a clinic was West Point. And so that, so that kind of got us started into the tournament mood. Um, and then you have also the official league, which I'm, I'm going to talk about later. All right, so for the structure of the club, this is my personal recommendation on how you should approach that. Um, you want the administrative side, which is uh, required if you want to be official within your university. Um, and so we, we approach that with the executive board. Um, and then you want a social aspect you know, for team cohesion, for people to get to know each other, um, for the university to get to know um, the, the club, a uh, thon is something very specific to Penn State. So that wouldn't apply to you, but the rest, um, are major positions that I think you should have, and you can add as many as you want. You can have an outreach chair. Uh, we don't have enough people to do that or enough interest, but, um, that would be a very big plus if you have someone really dedicated to doing outreach. Um, and then the final and obvious aspect is physical. Um, the president, so me, is basically the trainer in our club, but it doesn't have to be that. Um, you can you know, choose whether or not to do it that way. Um, we have a fitness coach for strengthening and conditioning, and we have a more specifically handball coach who accompanies us um, you know, during games, coaches us during the games, and assists the president um, during practices. And so what we did, 
um, is we installed um, three practices a week and we get practices and ideas from um, XPS, which was mentioned earlier today. Um, social media and internet, this is a big, big aspect. Um, I watch a lot of handball on Instagram, for example, and there's a lot of practice ideas that come up uh, regularly. And then get um, ideas from experienced players. So I've been playing for six years now and my dad and his dad before him were handball players and coaches that did both. So that's how I kind of got, you know, that um, handball background and I was able to lead and offer ideas for practices. Um, and then so the Northeast Team Handball League is the league that we're under. And so they reach out to us for availabilities, organize, you know, the schedule for the tournaments and then uh, reach back to us um, to give us the schedule basically. All right, recruitment strategies. This is very difficult. It's probably the most difficult when starting a, a club, but once you get, you know, the, the basic idea, um, it's easy to know where to look. Um, and so these are the, the four main ways that we've been, um, well, four or five main ways that we've been doing recruitment is through social media. Um, we are very active on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Um, and so we try to reach out and, and uh, get people to know us. Merch, um, if you walk across campus with some handball club gear on, um, people tend to look at you and, and you know, question um, what that club is and, you know, because um, you look cool, basically. Um, and then university events uh, have been, and club sports events have been a big, big help for us. The involvement fair is a must be, a must have, sorry. Um, and that's how we got the 30 members last fall. Um, new student orientation is like the, you know, the basically the week before classes start where freshmen come in and they have all those sessions and advisor meetings um, to try and get get things started. And so our coach is actually an advisor for that. So he was able to talk about handball um, and get a few a few players like that. Um, so this is also a big recommendation from me. Um, and lastly, talk about it. Um, I, I am pretty heavy on talking about handball uh, to anyone who wants or doesn't want to hear it. Um, so talk about it and, and people might not know it. So just introduce the sport and, and get people to think about it. Um, for fundraising, um, again, four major categories. One is a donor drive. Um, you can set that up and often your Competitive, competitive sports office will reach out to you and offer to create a donor, a donor link. At least that's how it happened for us, but you can always just reach out to, to them directly and ask. Um, local restaurants, big one, um, you can keep a percentage of the, um, of the sale um, if, if you enter a code or that kind of thing. So this is a big help for fundraising. You can do seasonal sales. Um, we are recently uh, starting to do stickers as well, uh, which people tend to love and use a lot. Um, or you can sell merch to people outside of your organization. Um, and then the last one we've done, so it's specific to Penn State, but we've done the stadium in uh, BJC, so like the arena cleanup. And so we, we get paid for that. All right, um, so those are the main teams, games that we've played uh, the past few years, again, under the, the league. Um, and so we do both official tournaments that lead to nationals, but also clinics. So it's like a, a more, I mean, I want to say relaxed, but not really. It's, a, it's an actual game. It just doesn't count towards the requirements for nationals. Um, and we do that a lot. We just travel. Uh, we've traveled to um, West Point, North Carolina, um, and more, and even Toronto last fall, which was an amazing trip. Um, and so we try to multiply um, the, the clinics and tournaments that we do so we can get more experience uh, because um, well, practices teach you the basics, but um, being in the game setting is, is uh, crucial to learn handball. All right. Um, so that's, that's my last slide. I have no idea how fast I talked, but um, basically COVID and graduation 2020 hit us pretty hard. And that, that you know, things happen. Um, and so you want to learn how to react to things um, and, and, and expected events. So graduation 2020, we lost a lot of our players, um, pretty much half of the team, if not more. Um, and so it was, it was crucial for me to get more people, but then COVID happened, so there is no involvement fair besides a virtual one, which is um, not the same thing at all. 
Um, and so we lost players, we lost participation because everything was on Zoom this semester. Um, and then we lost funding because uh, club sports froze out um, most of the funding. So uh, from that, what we need to do is recover from it. And we have, we have plans, you know, we have um, like um, strategies in place already to try and get back up from that. Um, and that includes also multiplying the recruitment strategies. So rather than um, or relying on involvement fair, um, we want to use more posters, more emails, um, get into classrooms, talk to other team sports, et cetera. So we want to you know, open that up um, inside and outside of Penn State so we can get high school students to learn about the sport and, and already be aware of it once they reach college. Um, then we want to build a strong heritage at Penn State. And so we've been doing a lot of um, administrative efforts, especially this semester, since we had less practices. Um, and so you want to, you know, you want to create plans, create schedules that later um, executive boards can rely on so that they don't have to think about the whole thing all the way from the beginning again. Um, a training plan. Um, so XPS is an amazing app that uh, we just started using. And I want to try and you know, uh, become more familiar and train later um, board members uh, for that, like with that app. Um, we want to get back to playing and competing. Um, we miss it a lot. And I, I keep receiving texts from the team members uh, and past team members. Oh, we miss handball. And I do too, but it's difficult right now. So hopefully we get back to it soon. Um, and yeah, and we, we hope that uh, one that Penn State is going to have some national players. We'll see. So I have, uh, I have a question for you. And yeah, so yeah. Um, one of the, and as an experienced uh, club starter and then move and leave. And do you, have you thought about uh, secession plans and how important they are for uh, clubs and colleges and especially colleges because the very nature of, um, I'll give you an example at like University of Minnesota, we started a group. But once they graduate, they can't officially partake. I always had to have a active player or would have had to because we were at the beginning phase. Uh, and I know the rules are probably similar at Penn State, but secession planning is so important. Have you considered that? Because once one highly motivated person leaves an organization, they typically fall apart. Um, sad, sad state of, uh, but that's typical in almost all organizations. And so I, I sense that you are a, real a dynamic person, but uh, have you thought about secession planning and developing the person to replace you in the younger group? West Point's brilliant at it. Even though it's, even though it's an organization that's, that's fully funded and supported, they're very good about the gold and black and moving their way up through that and creating leaders to fill the vacuum once the other players leave. So just curious. Yeah, so that's, that's part of the, the building, the strong heritage at Penn State. Um, I, so one thing that I want, that I was thinking about doing is um, first having, you know, a, a schedule of all the deadlines uh, that club sports have so that later teams don't have to worry about it. They can focus on, you know, the handball aspect of it. So once they tackle that administrative club sports aspect of it, then um, they can, they can focus on more the club and, and teaching handball. And so how this, um, is approach here, how I want to approach it is, um, we have currently members that um, are freshmen, sophomores, so they're gonna stay here for another two years. And so starting next semester, I'm gonna spend like a semester just um, with like interested people shadowing me. Um, and so kind of going through what it means to be a president and how to um, teach handball, how to learn handball um, and how to go you know, through that phase of development of a club. So um, shadowing is like um, hopefully going to happen next semester. And if not, um, I'm pretty good at documenting. Um, so that's kind of what we're going to have to rely on. Um, also, I'm pretty easy to reach out to. So I'm going to be around, even though I graduate next spring, I'm going to be around to answer questions, to offer practice ideas, to you know, send links and everything. So keeping that communication going, and that's what I'm doing with the former president who graduated last spring, is keeping that running communication so that, you know, any questions that we have, we can ask the previous person. Uh, but yeah, so shadowing documentation and communications 
communication is basically uh, what we're going to base ourselves off of for the next years. And then, and then the flip side, and that's an, I think an important area of discussion for all of us here today, is the flip side being that the legacy aspect. And I, I feel this is probably an area West Point is weakest at. Some of their players, they, for the number of players they create, so few remain in the sport. The dynamics are different. They go into active duty. You know, they have their, their active duty requirements. They, some come back, some don't, but let, have you, do you have any thoughts about legacy, meaning supporting players? So you have a player who plays four years at, at uh, Penn state, it, not that you have a responsibility, but you have a legacy that you can leave by push, by supporting them where they go to maybe start a club. Have you thought about that? Or are you just focused right now on this level of, of, <laughs> of surviving COVID and having, <laughs> having a team after the pandemic? But I think it's an important concept for people to, to think about. And I think for here at, in this development symposium, it has to be mentioned that, that that's a very important thing. When, the, when our players move away, we're, st if we're still responsible in a part for them and we should feel responsible in, if we wish for the sport to survive and then flourish. So I'm just curious what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, so our, our club is very still very new. Um, so this is not something that we've been um, focusing on so far, but I know personally, I wanna do that. I know that I wanna be able to play handball wherever I go to work. Um, and so we haven't put anything in place yet, but um, I have a strong hope that it's going to be put in place as soon as we recover, you know, from that uh, downfall kind of situation. But um, it's a really good point. Um, I had not focused that much on it, but I, yeah, I think it's I, I, I think it's something that clubs and especially college teams, you that not just preparing for who replaces you, but also you, you're, you're preparing a kit for them to take with them to start a club. And if we all do that, if we have this, the college game provides us access to athletes we wouldn't normally have. Sometimes they're elevated athletes. They have designated time that is like, they're just there. They're not going to be able to go travel everywhere. I've had college kids on the national team. It's brutal. But we have stuff in May. We have to do a travel and it's finals week and it ruins your, you know, as Julio can relate, youth and junior national team coaches hate may because it's finals time and we lose our you know some of our key players but i think it's important that we consider as an organization and also as people that are this legacy aspect that we send out into the world we have to em embrace it empower it and and give it legs to run on because that's where we're going to find it you know i'm looking right now at the players that i raised up from middle school to high school are now in the freshman year of college kids that Julio and I took in 2015 and 16 to Sweden and they were little kids are now taller than us and and in college and and I think about how that some of them have reached back to me and how important it would have been had I had been focused on preparing to create legacies wherever they went empowering them if they had a kit with them to say content like you put here that's why I wanted someone to talk about starting a college team there's strategic steps to it each college is a little bit different but in the end, they're all the same. There's a structure to it. And if they have, if they're prepared for it, they can start college teams and find success. So I really appreciate you coming in today. I, I, I know we have to move on to the next, but it's been, it's a good conversation and an important conversation to have. And we really appreciate you spending your time. I know it's free finals week. My LSU student just finished his finals on Friday. And I don't think I've seen him move from the couch in two days. So yeah, <laughs> yeah mine, mine are starting next week. So yeah, so well, good luck for everything. And we appreciate you coming on today. And now thank I, you. thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Julio, do you want a two, five, five minute break or are you? <laughs> five minutes for everybody, yes. Okay, let's do five minutes everybody and then we'll come back for the last lecture of the module um, on uh, tactics in defense and retreat for, with, uh, with Julio Sainz. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Thank you.
another name that I have chosen for this morning. All right, one more minute and we'll start the presentation. All right, well, thank you all for following us this morning. Um, two uh, fantastic uh, presentations, I, I think. Um, for those who um, missed the presentation about SPS or sidelines, uh, we're asking some questions in the chat room, um, state, um, towards the end and we'll give you the information or you can simply uh, talk to USA Team Humble and USA Team Humble will help you with um, getting in contact with our counterparts, friends at um, SPS or Sideline Sports. Um, so, but we're gonna talk about defense right now. And I, as I mentioned to you before, I am passionate about defense. Um, uh, Craig did a fantastic presentation about the the the, um, the tactics of the attacks. We're going to talk a little bit about the the tactics of defense and and how I I used it, you know, uh, and I have used it through uh, all my um, entire um, journey with the uh, Union National Team and how I see it, how I understand it, uh, what are the things that I that I look. And um, I'll talk a little bit about uh, a few uh, technical um, aspect of building defense. I'm not gonna have uh, such a deep dive like Craig did in, in, um, in the attack. Um, if you per se, the emphasis will be on defense, uh, you know, at a more, um, um, at a higher level of understanding. Um, but I think that if you look at Craig's presentation on defense, on, on attack, um, it will be basically the counter actions of, um, to uh, neutralize what Craig was proposing on the attack. But let's start uh, with defense tactics. So it's very simple. You know, positive defensive collaboration equals high chances of neutralizing adversaries. So what we're trying to do uh, is create a, a relationship or divergence between the attack and defense. Basically, we, like I mentioned before, what we're trying to do in the attack and defense, I'm sorry, is counteract everything that has been proposed on, uh, on, on the attack, okay? It could be at a uh, uh, individual level, it could be a small, a small group or small collaboration uh, level, or it could be simply at a, uh, a macro or more game situation level, okay? So as I mentioned before, in the um, uh, individual part of it, the main objective remains the same. Uh, we want to regain the position of the ball. We want to reduce the opponent's progression towards the goal, and we want to defend the goal. I remember being a little kid, and my coach told me, your job as a defender is to keep the ball as far as you can from, from the goal. Meaning that, you know, using that analogy that in the attack, you want to get as close as you can. On defense, you want to keep that ball away from the goalie as much as you can. Because as I mentioned before, the actual objective of this game is to pull the ball in the back of the net. So we want to do that um, to avoid that. Now, as a secondary measure, you want to create a system of help. You know, those pistol of movements that we're talking about, the covers, the switch, you know, switching the opponents, the sliding counter picks. Those are more like the uh, collaborative, you know, um, actions that are gonna help, help us uh, protect the goal. Craig said something in the uh, uh, previous presentation that I really like. This is an invasive game. So what you wanna do is actually protect that invasion. You know, you wanna make sure that you, you uh, create a system that is going to protect your goalie from that invasion of, of attacker. And obviously 
have a clear understanding of the ideas of the opponents on the attack. Now, I'm going to start looking at, we're going to start looking at uh, some of the uh, videos, video clips from uh, what we did in World Championship. Now, uh, this is a very interesting uh, video because I can, I, you can see a lot of the things that we're talking about, but there's an element of the game playing that we are, that I'm going to give you so you understand uh, uh, the tactics of how we plan this game. We created a def defensive system uh, that, that offer one solution. And then the solution was, and the solution was that we will force, we will give the outside uh, shots uh, for the opponents. Meaning that we created something that would allow the uh, opponents to take the, uh, the win shot because of the quality that we have with uh, in, in the goal. You know, we have such a great uh, uh, goalkeeper that we, the, that we took that bet. We are gonna create a defensive system that is going to force, um, you know, the opponent to take the win shot and let uh, Rene uh, solve the situation, worst case scenario. But what we're gonna do is that we're gonna take the high performance, the high percentage area, which is the center of the, uh, the actual goal. So I want you to look at these uh, sequence of actions and how you're gonna see how uh, you can uh, go from the uh, tactical defensive system. So, so sometime, some uh, type of um, um, crew collaboration and also some type of individual actions. And then obviously the uh, final tactical idea, which is you know the individual duel between the shooter and the fantastic goal that we have, goalie that we have. So as you saw in that sequence, we, we started with a 5-1. We, um, we call it a, um, a shallow 5-1, which is a very low um, um, defense. And part of it is because we wanted uh, our defense not to be so reactive. We wanted to be proactive. So we created a, st a staggered uh, defensive system uh, because we wanted that. We wanted to um, um, reduce the speed of the game from, from Japan. But uh, in this little clip, you can see a lot of, of the elements that we have been talking about. Talk about the dissuading, the control of the, uh, the, um, um, the collaboration between the small groups, individual actions. We look at one of the, uh, the uh, topics that we talked yesterday in defending the ball, uh, how Aaron tried to actually, you know, um, it's a snap, it's snatch the ball from the, uh, from the attacker. And then towards the end, you know, we saw the, uh, the reducing of the, angle of shooting from the player so the goalie could actually have a better option um, on, on solving the problem, okay? We have another situation here, very similar. Oh, pardon, sorry. So as you can see, this is a different sequence where we, we now have other individual uh, uh, technical skills are actually um, linked in, in, the, in the different defensive actions to um, uh, provide um, the, uh, the actual structure of the defense uh, better results. And uh, you know, it's almost like a reverse engineering that, uh, that that we um, tried to do. So we, we went from the 5-1 to 
actually the small collaboration to the actual individual action that lead to the counterattack. In this case, it was actually um, um, a dynamic interception. Okay. One more video. Now we're playing 6-0, but the main objective of this was still the same. You say individual defense, borderline, he got the yellow card, but it still was able to solve that defensive duel. Active dissuasion, retreating, clear uh, alignment on the 2v2, okay, forcing the shot, exactly what we wanted, and the actual can, uh, resetting, the, uh, resetting the attack. Okay, so I have plenty of videos here, uh, which, you know, they all have the same uh, ideology and philosophy. So what we want to do is, is if we actually have everything in place, a successful defense will counteract effective actions in numerical parity. 1v1, 2v2, 2v3. We will create numerical advantage. That's the whole point. This is a very simple game. You create numerical disadvantage on, on the offense and, uh, uh, so, I'm sorry, on the offense, you will want to create numerical disadvantage on defense and vice versa, okay? Um, and if we do it right, obviously, we are going to uh, uh, counteract that numerical disadvantage. What's important is, is that we rendered the offense unable to build offensive and finalization actions. It's important. If we ended up doing that, if they ended up doing, you know, um, finding a way to finalize, then we, what we're going to do is a creative tactics that allows that finalization to be in an area that is going to have a lower percentage. Okay. So that's the main idea of creating uh, uh, tactics in, a, in the large scheme of the game, okay? So Craig was talking earlier about the, the small collaborations and all those uh, 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 individual uh, skills linked into, um, uh, into two or three and how they actually create a synergy and that synergy and, co and cohesion can actually end up uh, uh, be developing more um, important actions in the game leading to finalization. Well, what we're trying to do here is the same. We're trying to counteract that. So some of the uh, the um, most used um, collaboration uh, uh, ideas, and when you're building defense, or when you're talking about tactics and defense, are for example uh, the switching opponents, which are obviously actions in between two uh, two defenders. And why why I'm putting emphasis on two and perhaps not on three or four? Well, that's the smallest collaborative uh, uh, group that you can have. You're gonna have your inside defender working with your center defender, you can have the outside defender working with the inside and so forth. And then you start adding those uh, uh, change of actions until you uh, create what we want to do, which is basically the numerical uh, advantage on defense, okay? The counter pick, add those actions to neutralize the pick. A lot of, uh, a lot of the, uh, the, the, the players here in the US 18 handball uh, community they come from basketball, so they should have, you know, um, um, a good understanding of this. So switching opponents, one of the things that we use a lot, counter pick and a sliding, which is another, um, you know, important technique or, or um, the skill to develop in this more collaborative, you know, uh, group. Uh, now, Talk a little bit about 6-0 today, you know, and I wanted to talk about an action, an actual uh, defensive system, because I think it is important that that you use something that will help you uh, moving forward with your development or moving forward with with the progression of your of your tactical ideas and what you want to do with your with your coach or what is it that you're going to do. We have already decided that. Man to man is important. There's a progression def defense uh, from man to man to make channel to six zero. Now I'm gonna go to a straight to six zero, even though that perhaps I, I um, eventually in the future we'll talk about more about the open differences and methodology from going from one place to the other. But I wanted to talk about six zero because 
the importance of of controlling um, having a good uh, uh, sonal defense, uh, especially with the um, the use of the seven player. And I'll show I'll talk a little bit more about this when we um, uh, see the uh, the use of the seven player presentation. The importance of understanding how we, you need to be able to go from the six zero now to open, but be able to retreat to a six zero and have it, um, yeah, you know, have it done it properly. So let's talk about six zero. It can be placed in, uh, in a block, it's a deep defense, it can be, you know, it can be flexible, it can be really uh, sonal when you're following the, uh, uh, the ball. Uh, it can be very dense at times, it can be very wide, uh, but, you know, some people suggest not to have it as deep as, as a 5-1. I personally, uh, in my teams, what I like to do is come from, as, from a 6-0 and then become very flexible for a couple of seconds of the attack and then come back to uh, the 6-0. Can go out to 8-9 meters. If you put them out so much, then you're talking about that this is perhaps a 5-1 or a 4-2 or whatever it is that you're trying to think about. Uh, the players are close to each other, so there's um, there's less, less opportunity for attacking the gap. Um, and then a, a few of the uh, uh, suggestions is that the center defenders are being tall, then um, there will be better chances for the goalie to stop the, uh, the shot from the back. Okay, so now let's look about all this from the perspective of Russia and Norway, okay? Which are two fantastic uh, six zero defense. So a, a clear example of a solid uh, Sonal 6-0, six, six which is basically following the ball. You know, um, the, the athletes are very cohesive, you know, uh, taking care of their uh, spaces in the court and what they, um, what they probably uh, have been asked by their coaches um, to control. Okay, the, we were talking about the task that you assign to the, uh, to the players. Okay, another sample of the... Um, This is another example of, you know, a strong cohesive defense. In this case, is an inferiority. They still did not lose the idea of, of how they were uh, um, defending. The philosophical idea of the 6-0 remained the same, even in inferiority. Okay, and now we're going to see another type of defense. Now we're going to look at the flexible defense, the 6-0 defense, uh, uh, a defense that is more uh, uh, geared to a man-to-man -man approach. Uh, and this is done by Spain. So in this case, we have a, a six zero defense that it, it has an emphasis more in the man to man uh, uh, approach to the game. Um, you don't have the, 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 the health system that Darwick uh, was showing, but uh, you still are successful because of the, uh, the skill set of the Spanish. However, even when there was actually uh, an attacking action, you went to the joint, they went to the joint uh, collaborative um, uh, action in which they both blocked and were able to um, uh, have a positive action of collaboration with the, uh, with the goalie. Okay, this is another sample.
So as you can see now, uh, there was a clear uh, uh, um, use of the blocking uh, as a skill in collaboration with the goalie. And um, that approach immediately launched the, uh, the counterattack. Okay, so brief summary, you know, the wings will uh, always uh, uh, try to work in one-on-one -on -one against the opponent. That's what I do on, on, on my defense. You know, it will prevent circulation of the wind behind the center. Um, um, defender, that's what the tasks of the wings are, okay? We collaborate with the uh, center um, as creating a, a zone. Sometimes I call it what's uh, a pseudo, a pseudo number two, which is, you know, the, the number one, if, if my number three has become a little bit flexible, they actually uh, go up a little bit and then we continue the defensive wall. Uh, the central defenders, they have to understand, you know, very well uh, the uh, change of opponents and counter picks. They need to uh, shift uh, based on the ball directions. Um, the opponents to the player with the balls always protected by the help of the two teammates next to each other. That's what we're talking about. And that triangle that is, um, you know, created when you build this type of defense and avoid the pivot. The defense, the, the, Avoid the people to actually go into, into a, a, a position. And the meaning, the meaning of the control of the people um, um, in a sense is that the idea of the people is to fragment the defense. So if we actually have a defense that doesn't know how to control the, uh, the, uh, the people very well, automatically th that person who's an inserted, is an inserted uh, position is already uh, you know, breaking or harassing that collaboration system that we have actually uh, uh, talked before. If you put a pivot and they know how to control it between a say uh, insider or, or a center defender, uh, automatically uh, that synergy of the defense is uh, interrupted by that, by that player, okay? Uh, six years effective against team with no good or long distance shooting, you know, against team with two second uh, good line, um, uh, second line of attack, the line players, uh, good against transformations. Uh, some of the strengths is avoid the opponent's uh, coloration with the pivot. Uh, it defines the, the responsibilities in advance. Um, a lot of collective work that is actually important for teams who are developing, you know, is good against team with, uh, against team with, uh, that have uh, long distance shooting um, and is good for transformations of three, three and two, four. Sorry that I'm rushing through this, but I really want to be mindful of time. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about a retreat as well. Um, the retreat is a reactive collaborative action. And by the way, all these slides I'll make available to you guys. Um, at any point, we'll, um, I will be able to uh, converse if needed be, but I want to make sure that we keep time um, on target. So the retreat is a reactive collaborative action that neutralizes attack in a transitional game situation. So we went for the uh, attack defense um, uh, game play, the field of play on the courts of the opponent. Now we have a defensive action that is in transition. What I mean transition meaning that it's using, you know, the, those quarters of the court that we don't use, okay? Uh, for me, it has the same tactical principle of the defense. So. All the skills that we that we use uh, when we are defending can actually be, you know, transplanted or tr uh, transformed into the uh, the retreat. It just that is going to be in the transitional uh, area of the of the, uh, of the court. The main idea remains as defense. Uh, avoid the transitional game in zones of high finalization percentage. So we're still trying to force, you know, that attack to be areas where not with not going to be you know, positive. We want to delay the linkage of the small collaborative actions in the attack. It's as simple as that. It's the same principle. It's just that it's in another environment. It is important in the interruption of the positive decision-making in the attack. What we want to do is that. We want to make sure that they go into second, third wave of attack. They go into transitional game. They, we want to force them to, to actually go into the, uh, the attack that is harder to achieve. You know, counter attack is, 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 is an easy goal. It's one pass, you know, dual between the goalie one-on-one, -on -one, 80 to 20% or more chances of being successful. If you start reducing that chance, 
you're forcing the team to go then into the most complicated actions, which are those actions for the uh, set plays or trans, um, a positional play, okay? And also, as I mentioned, you know, if, if we wanna make sure that we force the opponent to take a difficult route to uh, uh, set their attack. Uh, there always, there always are going to be uh, an array of individual and collective actions. And one thing that I just learned um, uh, recently from uh, uh, a coach in, in a symposium is, is a term that I that I that I use a lot a lot in my in my personal life, uh, but I never imagined I could actually you know um, transplant it to to a retreat. And is that we need to start using proactive action rather than reactions. Normally we react to the to the um, to the actual uh, turnover, and uh, we we forget to train about the possibility of creating even a proactive action during a turnover. So if you if you can anticipate that things might not go well, then what is it that you're doing to actually uh, solve the problem? Uh, I think I had the uh, video of no, I showed it to you guys uh, yesterday the video of uh, William Kennedy and how we did the, uh, the transformation. So um, that's all I have in defense. I, I apologize if I rushed it a little bit, but I wanted to make sure that, that um, the presenters after me, you know, and, and everyone else can have a fair chance. I have a one word not question. Be, not be rushed like me. I have a one word question for you to, or a one word answer from a question. What's the most important quality in a defender? Wow, that's man. It's hard to uh, one word. <laughs> think, think. What's the one quality you love? We all have different control ones. of your control of the attacker. It's as simple as that. If you can have win the individual duel, you're not going to be able to to actually work in any um, um, system. That's a good answer, by the, the way. <laughs> it's a very good answer. I agree. It, it's as simple as that. Is if you cannot, if you're not able to solve the problems at individual level, you're never gonna be able to solve it at, at the uh, at a group, small group or a, or, or a tactical level. You know, I, I see I see sometimes this, these uh, coaches who um, um, decide to go on an open defense um, with zero to no skills in, in, in a man-to-man -man situations. And it's just like, why are you doing? At least let them play six <laughs> I, zero. And they, I made that mistake in a in a in a last group stage before making the semifinals in Partile Cup, and you don't make that mistake again. <laughs> so I appreciate you, Julio, and your your uh, expertise in defense. I know we're going to keep on schedule, and we have uh, Christian Latulip, uh, the women's uh, national team coach, head coach, and my Hi guys, my boss on that staff, and I work daily Christian. with Christian. So I and Julio previously worked with Christian, so we're all good friends here. Um, in our USA gear, it could be a tournament bringing yeah. ending COVID. So Christian's going to talk about a national team perspective with tactics, and I'll let him share his screen and begin discussing, and then we'll come back for questions. Remember, if you have questions for Christian, please ask them um, before, but I, uh, we will prepare some for him as well so we can grill him. So thanks, Christian, for showing up and, and yeah. giving us your expertise. Thanks, guys. It was uh, very nice to see you uh, doing uh, all these uh, different um, – project and all this uh, symposium it's very good for for usa team and ball it's very good for for uh for our community so i hope you guys enjoy this um here's my presentation give me a second um as uh, craig said i've been asked to uh put together uh some sort of information about tactical demand of the modern international games uh, but before I get to that particular point, I want to make sure uh, you guys, um, give me a second. Um, I, want, I want to make sure you guys, there is some key factors you must consider um, in order to really assess the, uh, the tactical demand at the international level. level. So first, um, your, what is your, your personal high performance model? I think uh, Craig and Julio did a great job presenting you like the different 
level, uh, between like uh, uh, individual um, collaboration with two people and then the, the overall the game tactics. Uh, but I think each coach must have in their head what they will, what's important for them for the game. And I think you, know, you, ha you must have your high performance model in your head. And then I'll come back to the other point a little bit later. Um, so as you as a, I think it's important to have, have a great idea of what you need to cover as a head coach for your team. Um, here's uh, a good brainstorming of what, for me, have an impact on the performance or on your objective. Let's say my objective is to win a medal at the Pan American Games. Here's should be all the inter, interdependent variable that must be improved control or in order to achieve my goals. So there is um, things on the court, like your tactical knowledge, your technical skills, your physical ab ability, qualities of your players, um, your ability to uh, make decision on the court, perceive decision, execution, adaptability, um, what I call the intellectual composition of each athlete and the mental skills of these athletes. So all these is all interrelated and, I, and it's our very key points uh, for you to, um, to, to perform. But there's also some in, uh, outside variables that have a big impact uh, on, the, on your performance. Uh, an obvious one is let's say your environment. Um, your, what do you have access to? Where can, when, when your athletes uh, can train? How much money your program have? Uh, do you have enough so you can uh, travel freely and have as many competitions you want and you can regroup your athletes the way you want or you're counting every pennies uh, just to try to see if you can organize at least a camp uh, prior to world championship uh, uh, or prior a big important competitions. Uh, COVID is an, an environmental uh, right now um, a huge variable. Uh, your federation all the legal aspects also are very important. The media, you know, um, Colleen did a good presentation and how is it was important for her to use every social media she can to try to recruit some athletes. So having access to those are important variables also that could uh, bring better recruit, better players and improve your performance on the long run. And same thing, social. Um, if your team has a good team cohesion, uh, the relation between teammates and coaches are are good, then it helps you know your team to perform. Also, if you're externally, all your athletes are well, uh, some fun, fam good family and friends, not too much issues. They can concentrate on on training and focus on their performance. It also helps them too. So. For me, this is my personal model. Everyone, you know, might have a, a different one, but these are all key important points for, for uh, performing at the high level. And today what I will focus on is only on the tactical knowledge and what is important um, to, um, to perform or to go further uh, in your companies. Uh, next point for me is the national team program plan. Um, there is a lot of things that are important here. How, how often you can train your player? Do you, are you in a residency program? Do you have access to camp? Can you train during those international week? Um, those are, are important in order to design the right plan. Um, and in order to perform at the high level, it's important that you, you play regular games at high level. Um, in, for national teams in the United States, it's very tough to stay to stay and play games only in uh, North America. Um, the level of, of, of the club team is not that good and uh, for national team level. So we have to travel a lot and we have to play in other countries. But all that, you know, all this have a, a huge cost. And sometimes, you know, we have some money, but sometimes, you know, our federation cannot support maybe the national teams the way they want. So we have to fundraise, we have to find uh, good opportunities and then you know we have to decide how we're going to best prepare for our objective so i'm going to want i want to show you some quick example on the national team program plan uh, in 2015 for financial reason uh, the federation decided to stop the residency program in, at auburn 
Um, we didn't qualify for the Pan American Games. We finished 10th at the Pan American Championship. So when we arrived in 2017, um, we were, you know, we, we had a good group of players. Uh, some of them played in Europe, keep training as hard as they can. And then we were able to achieve, you know, a second place at the Norca and the fifth place at the Pan American Games. But our main objective was to qualify for the Pan Am Games and was to, to um, make sure that we participated in this one and finish as, as high as possible for that Pan American Games. So therefore we sat down with a group of players and we decided to put a plan where we could play any game together as a team. And then we invest, you know, times and money and fundraising time in order to develop a good program. So we traveled uh, in China, Korea, Hungary, Germany, France, uh, all over the world in order to provide good opportunity uh, for the girls to play together and 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 participate and, and get a better chance to qualify for the Pan American Games, which we did. You know, before the Pan American Games qualifier, uh, we finish. Uh, we beat Canada and went and uh, participate to the Pan American Games. And we had a great run in, at the Pan American Games, finishing fourth, only lost, losing by one goal for a bronze medal game against Cuba, the Cuban team that, you know, beat us in the past by five, five or six goals. And now we, we dropped that to only a one goal difference. So uh, all this is important when you program your, your game plan and, and how much time you have together. It's a very key point. And it, it all have different, um, different important aspect of it depends on how much money sometimes you have and how much you can regroup. Um, one of the point after that in, in the design of your tactical demand or your, your game plan is to optimi optimize your player or team performance. And I think it's key at this point to have a good evaluation of your athletes' uh, strength and weaknesses. And it's also very important because you integrate sometimes some younger player and it's important to anticipate their potential development because you might be working one year or two years um, in, a, in advance of, of your main objective. So you must have a defined um, orientation for all your athletes in your program. And, and I think it, it's when it becomes very important is to define how each athlete on your group can make your team better and, 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 and find a role for everyone. So, and they believe that even, even somebody who's playing five minutes or 55 minutes or 10 minutes is, is as important as a, uh, each piece is very important and, and can bring breaks and great success to the team. Um, it's also important to optimize your time with them. As we saw, there is a constraint of finance and money. So when you're traveling in, in a country to play games, you wanna make sure you reproduce some uh, game situation that you will be in in a couple months from now in the important compete. So play must play uh, 15 minutes, 55 minutes, must be able to reproduce that almost every day or every two days. It's important that they are put in the same environment that they will live maybe uh, two or three years later. And always remember your objective. Uh, sometimes it's not the result of a game that you will play 18 months prior of big competitions. Um, and and it's sometimes it's also important to put in your player's head that this game is important and we want to play to win that one as much as possible. So there is some times for development and sometimes for some, some good times for performance. Um, I, I think after that, I want to also a, a good point, a very important point uh, in order to develop a good game plan is to know your enemy and you know your enemies in general. I think to, in, with today's technology, with live streaming, Facebook Live, and what we've been doing right now, you can no longer be surprised by your, your opponent. You know that Cuba have extremely uh, good one-on-one -on -one skills. Uh, you know that the Greenland always brings some sort of Danish style with sleek pass, a good speed, uh, and so on. You know that Canada will have strong defense and goalies. You know Puerto Rico, because of their size, will play a 4-2, 3-3, 3-2-1 defense, even 7-0-6. So each in, when you design your game plan, you must be ready for all these these different things. And and I think right now what the discussion we had this morning with uh, August about XPS, uh, the new technology become very, very, very important how you handle uh, and prepare your teams uh, for different games.
So you have no excuse to not be prepared for every system that you will face or every type of teams that you will face at the international level. So if I if I have to have one slot uh, for for me that it's important that that reflects the international dem demand of uh, um, international international games, the tactical demand for international games is this one. So for me, for all my players, uh, tactically to perform, the team must be ready to apply this. So first one, defense. They need to know all the defensive principle of man-to-man -man zone and mixed defense for all defensive formations, 6 0 5 one 3 2 one 4 2 and 3 3 And as I mentioned before, playing Puerto Rico is totally different or playing Uruguay is totally different than playing um, Greenland. So if you're not ready for that, we will fail at, at being competitive at this level. I think on the personal level, on the US side, we must know and master perfect at least two defense. So for us, it's a 6-0 zone. And we also have sometimes uh, some 5-1 or 5 plus 1 defense that we use that fit our skills. And I think it's important after that to know the strength and weakness of the opposing team, OK? The strength of weakness of our defense also. So we try to sometimes use different strategies uh, with, with, with the teams that we have or the players that we have. So it could be offense, defense. You might have a defense specialist. Uh, you might have to focus on one players on the other teams uh, because she's so good that she can beat us by herself. So there's different strategies and everything must be known by your team. Um, so you have to anticipate on opposing offense uh in in all different scenarios also if you're late in the games you're behind uh or you're ahead you lose the key players and in, in for injuries the money time management all this must be practiced and if you have if you don't have games if you don't have an imposter need to play together at least several times before a major match then that's when it becomes an issue after that, you, you're, I think it's key in your game plan that your fast game is suited to the placement of your player in defense and in, in your attack defense changes. So you want to make sure with your strong defense, you can generate some goals. And for that, your fast game for me is fast break, counter attack, transition play, uh, fast throw off. Everything there is suited to your placement of your player in defense. So it's, we talk about efficiency and not only about uh running for running um after that they need to master or no master the tech, tactical scheme in fast break like i said fast break fast throw off transition they need to make adjustment also depending on the op opponent retreat and they need to manage the risk taking uh in relation of the potential success and depending on the evolution of the score no point of running if you're ahead by five with two minutes to go you need to Make sure you know when to run and how to run uh, so we don't make or bad mistakes and, and lose a critical balls at a critical time. From the transition game, it's important to develop your offense. What's your attacking principle? Um, know and master offensive formation. Five uh, out, outside, one, one pivot. Four around, two pivot. Uh, different tactical schemes, open-end plays. Uh, all the things that a coach can request uh, and understand that the coach is usually trying to put their, his asset in the best, you know, condition as possible uh, so they can be, they can perform at the right time. I think uh, Craig did a good example with his player on his, uh, on his team. Um, so I think it's true for every situation that the coach is just thinking of a good maker, you're going to try to put the playmaker at a good place uh, with the ball in her hand so she can make the right decision. If you get a good outside shooter, or then you can you can you want you're gonna do that with with your technical knowledge and how how to best prepare your team for some key points. You have to know also anticipate what the opposing defense will put you in front of you. If they're gonna be a man to man on one of your best players, you need to be ready for that. We have a lot of tactical fun between us and Puerto Rico. I think we played the last uh, 20 games and we are 10 and 10 and there's like always different type of strategies uh, throw on so it, it's a very fun and uh, challenge every time we play a, this type of team but we also you know need to be ready on our side and be prepared for our, all potential scenarios 
We make big comebacks sometime against Greenland, being uh, behind by six, just by changing sometimes a few things in defense or in offense. So you must be also anticipate those scenario, positive or negative. Uh, losing players to injuries happen all the time. So mastering different scheme and having players ready to play in different scheme and offense is also extremely important. And finally, defensive retreat suited to the placement of your attackers and your attacking uh, change in defense. This is important uh, when you play Brazil, when you play Korea, if you know how to retreat and how to cut goals, you're going to get killed by 30 goals. Uh, if you, uh, as Julio said before, a little bit more proactive in that and anticipate also for the retreat, then you can cut the number of goals and be more competitive. So if you have to remember a few things, tactics demand in modern international games, uh, have four points. Uh, defense and goalkeeper will win games by itself. When you know when you start dominating a team in defense as you score those easy goals on fast break and you take control of the of the, um, the big space of the fast break control of, of that, then those are easier goals that you're never going to get in a, a set uh, set attack. So when you have a strong defense and good goalkeeper, you can go very far in a tournament. And I think it, it's true. Uh, when we get cr crushed by sometimes some teams like Brazil, it's because we're not able to score and then they just take over on fast break. In today's world, you have to play at very high speed and you have to play every phase sometimes at every very high speed. So that means you need top physical condition for your athletes, uh, meaning you need to be able to run fast break, counter attack, uh, transition so you can keep the ball going. You can try to play faster off also. You can be need to be ready to retreat. It's a fast-paced game. You just need to watch uh, Norway play or some of those teams to understand how quick it could be. Uh, you need to control the number of turns. So don't go too fast if it's create 10 turnovers. Try to go and control the ball also with uh, mastering uh, passing skills, for example. And offensively, offensively, you need to optimize the attack, attacking quality of your player through different plays, you know, when I watch a European Championship, you can see now that the the complexity of offense it, it becomes a more and more uh, professional in a sense that there is like three or four action in order uh, created like a player permutation, a crossing, block from the pivot, a one-on-one -on -one skill. You need almost to combine three or four of those in order to start creating some sort of space advantage for your team and for some of your player to score goals. So that's the tactical tactic demands, I think, in modern uh, hand, international handball. I um, uh, want to thanks again, Craig and Julio, for uh, working very hard for this symposium and uh, ready to answer any questions if you have any. Well, we have two questions from uh, uh, attendees, which we'll ask, and then I have a question, Julio may as well. Uh, the first one is, uh, personal question on when tryouts might be for the women's team and said together for the next Pan Am games, but I would just use it more general. Uh, do you have any specific for the women's national team uh, time frame right now? I think it's come from Maggie. I don't know if she's still around. I saw she it is Maggie. Uh, yeah. So hi Maggie. Um, yeah. Um, COVID kind of stopped us initially. We plan to do one in, uh, in January. Now I think it's going to be in July, uh, but I'll be in touch with you. I know you reach out to me. Uh, we just want to try to um, be able to host something, something on our, on our, in, in USA, so we can start doing practice again. But in this particular situation, it's it's a little tricky. Uh, but uh, we are working on it, and I hope by July of next year we could have a huge tryout. But I'll be in touch with you more personally for, uh, for let's say some sort of a tryout uh, in the future. Hopefully, uh, again, we still don't have any in-ball activities right now in U.S. And Europe, besides professional team, everything is blocked. So even me, I'm, on the, I'm not coaching at this moment because of most of the action in, in Europe is stopped. And we see how difficult it is for some country to host any event at this moment. But uh, yeah, I know it's coming. <laughs> and then a second question, and I, it's very relevant for as a national team coach, as a national team coach who right now has limited time, uh, how much specific tactics can you install when you have limited time with your players? Yeah, uh, that's why I think planning is important. You know, you need when you plan uh, 
you can no, not only plan for one one event. You need to have like a two year plan. You need to have a good idea of what what players you will have in your hand. And true, sometimes we need to install. You need to have a vision of what your teams will look like in two years from now or in one years from now. So I think you develop your. Uh, that's why we don't master four or five different defensive formation. Uh, I'm agree with uh, Robert uh, yesterday. We need to have two. You need to have a 6-0 and a 5-1. In offense, you reduce the playbook maybe to five or six. You have one or two things for the uh, man advantage, and you need to keep it secure because you prefer to have high qualities than quantity. And I think that's the key right now is you're going to need sometimes, and sometimes you don't have that much because we don't have that much money also to regroup, but you need to do the best in the conditions we have. But we've been doing a lot better lately in in – and going into competitions with better preparation. And I think we, we did a very good job for the Pan Am Games uh, qualifiers, Pan Am Games uh, preparation, uh, where we play almost 50 games uh, all around the world. And then uh, one more question from uh, Robin. How do you know when to change a defensive formation versus changing a player who might be the weakness in the formation? Uh, when we are struggling, let's say you take a 5-0 or 6-0 and you know the team, you're not, no longer able to stop the opponent and, and the time is running out and you know you have to make a change to try to make, make some adjustment. Uh, sometimes it's always the same thing that happens, the same strong players that, that creates the, the problems or they, they're launching a big left back for a big shot or a center back of always some good one-on-one. So you try to adapt your tactics. Sometimes you have the tools in your team. Sometimes you don't. So you must maybe play a five plus one, or you must adapt your six. So being a little bit more concentrated in certain area, or sometimes I switch, I will put, I will create matchup. I will put my best defender against the problem, but sometimes it open up other gaps. So, so all those things happen. And I think you try to make the best decision for your team. And then I'll ask this one final question because uh, we're running out of time. And uh, actually, uh, one of our venerable veterans of USA Handball, Jim, is asking, do you still scout the opponent's goalkeeper with a shot chart to help the offense? Yeah, we have the videos. And, um, you know, I, 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 there's, there's two philosophy here. So sometimes you have the information, but when you provide too much information to an athlete, they start thinking too much. Uh, but uh, sometimes if you provide the right information, it's also very helpful. Uh, we like to scout uh, open and shots so our goalkeepers have a better idea uh, when to go and where to go for certain shots. And some goalkeepers are very good at that. I think Sophie, uh, she will work well with her with that. She, she likes to know where tendencies of each player are, but sometimes other goalkeepers don't like that because they, they start thinking too much and it kind of take away their, their rhythm a little bit. So starting, starting thinking too much. So it really depends on each, each athlete. But in the ideal worlds, everybody will know the, the shooting charts from everyone. It's like in <laughs> baseball. My- yeah. From my personal experience, been the impromptu goalkeeper coach at the World Championships for two goalies that ended up getting man of the match awards each, but for different situations. I learned that it's very important for them not to just understand where the shot's going, but where it will come from, from an action. Yeah. And that is just as important to understand what actions and visually understanding what actions and where the likely finalization has come is just as important as understand where the final shot location would be. So, yeah. And you have time in the game, like who's shooting the first ball, who's shooting the last one, who's the go-to guy of another team. Like if you're playing against your team and you know, Amar will take that shot no matter what. So you, People yeah. must be ready and know his impact. So <laughs> he was, he had five defenders on him, but he wasn't. It doesn't done. matter. So it was he, done. It was chosen. At a critical time I, of the I, game, most of the times, you know, it's the same person is shooting the, the important ball. I have a story, uh, and it's funny because it's, it, it goes exactly what you're saying, Christian. Uh, so I, 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 when I help with Puerto Rico, I have two goalies, and one is exactly what you said. Just, you know, if you give me too much inf- information, you're taking the fun out, out of it. You know, I don't want to be thinking so much. just want to be able to have a little bit of fun and, and, and do uh, um, things my way. 
and then there was the other one who was like a student of the game like so and they both have the a way to balance each other so you know i think you're right it's about uh important information the the uh the information that you give to them that is relevant to how, how we, they're going to prove that their performance because it could be it's, it's about knowing your player way. it's about knowing your yeah. player like Thierry Omeyer in France, one of the best goalkeepers in, in history, will say he has a huge binder and all the shots you know, because he's crazy. He wants to, you know, he's crazy. And you can have that type of guys too. You know. But we also have to understand that we're talking about a development symposium and it's important for newly developed, newly developing players and young players to get sense and and uh of the situation without interference what i said before the coach needs to step up if you have if with young players especially like in the high school age you can give them too much information and it it will stymie their development because they're not getting they're not developing in the position naturally you're forcing artificial your idea of a position of an adult fully trained player should have but the developing process demands that they get a sense of the position i mean you're not even supposed to with young kids instruct goalkeeping let them have fun just yeah that's how you find goalkeepers the ones that stay in there you do a, a voluntary rotation you know, the ones that stay in there are the ones that end up staying with it but it's important to but at the senior but for, level but, but for me craig and and for the community and the level where we are in europe in us it's important that every coach out there is increasing the toolbox of yes. every athlete right if they have you know if they if they shoot better <laughs> dribble better if they defend better if they can, you know, do a good collaboration with a pivot, a wing, increase the toolbox as much as possible. Yeah. You know, France and all the European countries, they're spending hours and hours, you know, bringing kids at 14, 15 years old in program, training them a 12 hours a week, 15 hours a week, you know, providing all these individual skills. And then when they arrive at a high level, then coach just have to use their toolbox inside a game plan. So in, in cre in spending time on improving the toolbox for all the young athletes is, is crucial and yeah. it helps our performance so much better in, in the future. Well, I appreciate you uh, joining us, Christian. Christian will be here later doing a, uh, a second uh, lecture this afternoon on planning for season and tournaments and how his philosophy is behind it. So we very much appreciate it. Um, everyone, we're going to take a uh, break for 56 minutes. We will be back in an, almost an hour uh, to begin module four, where we learn about how to develop uh, tactics with the team and then focus on next steps for coaches and players. So thanks, everyone. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Christian. Thanks, Thank you, guys. Good to see you. Good to see you. Thank you. And just as an FYI, that module will be in a separate Zoom link. So be sure to get that in your registration email. Thank yeah. you. Thanks, Melissa.